Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 127. So glad you could join me. Today's guest is Marcella Shulak. She'll be here in about 12 minutes or so. Before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too, so please do click on that like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Leave a review if you're on iTunes um, or Spotify or any of those things later. Whatever you do to uh, share the word helps a lot, so please do if you would. Uh, we're going to start with a Poetry Spawn poem today, and we only have one um, poem that's going to be coming up this week. I'm going to do it a little differently, I decided. Instead of previewing any more poems we have forthcoming in the week, I think it's better to leave them as a surprise. So we do have one more poem coming up, um, but I'm going to leave it until maybe we'll talk to the poet next week, and then um, and then that poem can be a surprise when it comes out, because I think it... And it's not quite as exciting if you know it's coming, if you're a regular listener. And so um, I thought maybe we'd switch it up that way a little bit. But we have this poem today by Elizabeth McMoon Tatango. And we've published Elizabeth several times. She's won the um, uh, like Frassic Challenge twice or thrice, maybe. She's also been a few times um, in Rattle. We might have published her six or seven times. And this is a poem... Uh, it was funny, on Twitter, somebody said, well, I know what Rattle's inbox is going to be full of this week. And it was this story right here. Um, in a medical first, a man with terminal heart disease gets a transplant of genetically modified pig heart. And so here's a photo of the pig heart going inside um, this Maryland man, a 57-year-old, is doing well the three days after receiving a genetically modified pig heart in a first-of-its-kind transplant surgery. Um, University of Maryland Medicine said in a news release Monday. And so this person, David Bennett, had a terminal heart disease, and the pig heart was the only currently available option. According to the release, Bennett was deemed ineligible for a conventional heart transplant or an artificial heart pump after reviews of his medical records. And so instead, he was um, given this pig heart, which was genetically modified in order to fit a human. And so far, so good, I guess, which raises a lot of interesting you know, ethical and, um, you know, questions. And this was um, what what Elizabeth said about it. She said, uh, um, I don't know what it is, but I've been really fascinated by the pig heart transplant story this week. It manages to be at once inspiring, terrifying, unsettling, and hopefully all at once, a new information keeps being reported. I think what I wanted to explore here was how complicated the whole issue is. There are so many layers, and I feel like many of these layers clash with our general desire to simplify everything into the most pal palatable version of itself. I've seen several photos included in news reports, but the one that struck with me was the one with the heart over the drape outside of either the pig or the recipient waiting for its next life. And that was the photograph we saw uh, right here. Uh, and this was a photograph that inspired this poem. And here we go. We will uh, we'll play it and see if we can get some audio going here. Transplant. I guess nice way to think about it is to say the pig was tissue paper packed around the heart. It's best to make it all seem clean. In the picture, the men pulled the whole red heart out through a hole in a green drape. Underneath, what we don't talk about, the soft, hurt, tender pink, and held above the heart alone like glitter stars. Nothing distasteful. It could be a valentine if you like that. You stole my heart. Of course, the pig's not tissue paper. Of course, we have to make decisions. Once again, that was uh, Transplant by Elizabeth McMoon Tatenko. Um, and a short, beautiful poem. And the other thing that I that I saw is apparently the person um, um, who received the heart. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Maybe I should uh, <laughs> investigate further. But there were a bunch of poems submitted about this, probably a dozen. And a few of them mentioned that he um, had stabbed somebody a long time ago. And and the, the person ended up dying much later um, from, from sort of complications. It ended up paralyzed. Um, and so there's a lot of moral, moral and ethical questions, too, about whether, you know, who deserves what and things like that, too. So it's a very fascinating story, but a great um, you know, advancement of science as well, um, that we get to, you know, save people this way. Um, and 
I don't know. I mean, the the whole, you know, being raised, it sort of gives a whole new meaning to Charlotte's Web or something. Um, let's look up some more poems from the past. And I thought we would travel back, first of all, we'll travel back in time um, to a year ago this year. And, um, sorry, I have a, hang on a second. It's not coming. I have a sneeze that's not coming, but um, I'll keep it off the mute. But if I sneeze, that's what that's what you hear. So um, Julia B. Levine wrote this. Instructions for the day after was last year's poem, or right around this time. And um, and uh, here we go. Okay, got the sneeze out. <laughs> so here's a. Uh, Julia B. Levine's uh, poem for already um, the day after January 6th. uh, And she writes, Already the January 6th violent attack on the Capitol has been added to Wikipedia. There is a mystic belief in God's perfection, the need to be shattered in order for this world to appear. Our job is to try and repair it the best we can. This helps. And here's Julia Levine's poem. Um, Instructions for the day after. Instructions for the day after. Let us start with the difficult miracle of being, the wild ravening of a creek singing the falsetto and minor keys through a million throats of gravel and flint, the alders turning towards a sharper green. Now let us pause a moment on this bench beside the trail and look across the lagoon to those boys at play in sand. Sound travels so perfectly over water, but tell me, is it Farsi or Hebrew they are speaking? Six gulls white as tombstones fly overhead. After all these epochs and the salt light of January, elk and deer grazing on this new green after rain, let us consider that we are still walking over the leech fields of slavery and genocide. Now let us take inventory of our terror, our longing as a lyric violence, our flesh as shroud and veil. How last night in pitch black, the coyotes were not just calling, but keening for something deeply torn. Today, let us consider repair. How the smaller of the two boys kneels at the mirror of the dark water like the congressman who spent the night on his knees picking up glass and bullet casings from the rotunda floor. Let us remember that old story about God shattering his own perfection to make room for this world. As for giving up on America, do you hear it too, that young boy calling to his brother, how in the mouth of a young child Every language sounds like water leaping, tumbling into song. And once again, that was Julia, um, uh, Julia B. Levine with instructions for the day after, a poem from a year ago. And I had three sneezes, but hopefully I kept them all off mic. Um, let's go back even more farther in time. And uh, see, I see, I just love the way the Poet Respond works as an almanac. And we can see what was going on years and years ago and uh maybe we should go to 2000 let's do 2016 2016 five years ago to this week um this was uh the week that uh david bowie passed away so we have this poem by colin pope major tom turns into light and um colin pope says i was always a huge bowie fan As soon as I heard about his passing, I began writing poems frantically, simply to cope with the loss of such a giant talent. It was incredible to me he could, in the span of a few seconds, move from the hopeful to the terrifying to the comically ironic. I remember hearing Space Oddity for the first time. It was on the radio as my mother drove me home from school. We both stopped talking, almost automatically, as though there was a secret pact that we wouldn't interrupt each other's experience. That's what Bowie was, an experience. And here's Colin Pope reading, Major Tom Turns Into Light. (laughs) 
Oops, I guess I better read it myself because we we included a little bit of uh, the audio. I think it's Colin playing it, um, but uh, I think the YouTube's not going to be happy. So let me just read Major Tom Turns Into Light by Colin Pope for David Bowie. All those years of training and G-force tests and bone densities and the anti-gravitational endless drop in the belly of the airplane would be plenty to forge the metal of his genius into a NASA-approved alloy, whereby the notion of death nested behind the vacuum of the eye sockets like an organ awaiting some second adolescence to begin churning its unpredictable hormone into the blood and since we believed in no more we turned in tuned in to watch the rocket ascend as though it were pulling our hearts behind the way a wedding car clanks its lovely cans toward a waterfall or white sand beach or a bed upon which a definition waits awakening and then proving over and over and over with the ink of moan and gasp until it disappears into a hope as perfect as a needle puncturing the sky which is why he was chosen to be lost and never found and spinning in a mass of every wire and element and sound the whole human race had taken millennia to discover for this one trip from which we knew he would not return since he knew there was nothing but limits and the blinding phosphorescent joy it would take to destroy them that was colin pope's poem from january 12th 2016 in memory of david bowie who just passed away okay and so that's a little bit of a uh, look back in time and a look at current events through Poets Respond. And now let's take a quick break and we'll get uh, today's guest, Marcella Shulak, on the line. Hey, thanks so much for your patience. Uh, as I mentioned, today's guest is Marcella Shulak. Marcella has published four titles with Black Lawrence Press, three poetry collections, including City of Skyscrapers and a lyric memoir, Mouthful of Seeds. Shulak, who translates from the Hebrew, Czech, and French, is a 2019 NEA Translation Fellow, and her fourth book-length translation of poetry, 20 Girls to Envy Me, selected poems of Orit Gadali, was nominated for the 2017 Penn Award for Poetry and Translation. She coordinates the poetry track of the Shandy Rudolph Graduate Program in Creative Writing at Bar Elaine University, uh, where she is an associate professor in American literature. She edits the Illinois Review and hosts the TLV1 radio podcast, Tra Israel in Translation. And she was the guest on Rattlecast number 107, where we focused on her own work. And we it was such a great... I mean, I look, look, listened back at this episode, and uh, you should all go back to episode 107. It was an excellent one. But it was such a, we had such a good time talking about her work. We never got to the translations. So I thought that we would have another episode just focusing on the translation. So, uh, and that's what we're going to do today. And here she is, Marcella Shulak. Hey, Marcella, how's it going? Hi there. Thanks for having me back. I had so much fun last time. It was one of the few times I I learned more than I, than I <laughs> talked about. I learned so much from you. It was it's so much fun. It just, it just was a lot of fun. And, um, and this episode's going to be different because it's almost like a show and tell episode. You have so much translation work, and I really—it's really fascinating to get a glimpse at all these different poets that we might not, as you know, American English readers of poetry experience. Um, so we have five different writers that we're going to talk about today, and yeah. um, it's kind of going to be more just you sharing what you've done and what who these poets are like. So do you want to get started? Uh, who who do you want to focus on first? 
Absolutely. And I don't know if we want to start off with the Hebrew, which is most recent, or with the Czech, which was what started it all off. Um, which, um, whichever you prefer. I have, um, I, I mean, I have everything right here. Right. <laughs> well, you know what? We can start with, we can go back in time. Okay. Let's go back in time. So we'll start off it, it, with the present and we'll slowly move back to simpler times as we go. And I was just thinking, you know, it sounds a little random to think about the different kinds of things that I translate, but Hebrew and Czech, even though they're really, really different, they have a lot in common in the sense that they are old languages that were both out of commission for literature for a few hundred years or centuries. Um, and then they were slowly revived. Um, and so, in that sense, they share something with Irish um, and other small languages like that. Um, I'm kind of interested in some of the texts that sort of define uh, a literature as a nation or that kind of work with defining themselves. And so that's sort of what they all have in common. When you say um, out of commission, like, what do you mean by that? Like, Well, in... In Hebrew, I mean, Hebrew has been in use, you know, constantly, mm -hmm. but it was mainly liturgical for a long time. Um, and so there was poetry written in Hebrew in, in the golden period, Spain, you know, in, in, uh, in Muslim Spain. And but it wasn't really until the founding of the state of Israel or just before that, that people began to use it frivolously, like for poetry, mm -hmm. rather than for um, communication internationally or for prayer. Um, the same with Czech. It had been it had been used on the countryside and families during the Habsburg monarchy, though, it was forbidden. It wasn't used um, officially in the Czech lands. German was. And so the universities, of course, Charles University had a, a, a Czech language um, track and a, alongside the German one. But for the most part, um, literature in Czech had been written in either Latin um, or sometimes German. And so it was only really with the Romantic Revival, 1830s, that Czech literature really began to flourish. And so that's what they both have in common. Um, we're not going to talk about the French stuff because that was just too far afield. But even that, I was working with the Congolese writer and he was writing in French to sort of tell the colonialists that he doesn't want to play the game anymore. And he couldn't do that in his native language because, you know, they wouldn't understand it. So so they all have that in common. They're all sort of working toward creating, you know, defining themselves as people and as a state or as a nation. So... Yeah. Yeah. So I will go ahead and start with the Hebrew and I'll start with, I'll do this a little backwards. I'll start with 20 Girls to Envy Me by Ori Gidali, which is right here. And I came to Israel about 11 years ago and I could use, I could do biblical Hebrew, but I didn't know modern Hebrew. And so I was teaching myself, I would go to classes and it wouldn't stick in my head. So I said, you know what, if I start working with poetry, it will help me remember, and I'll start learning it better. It'll be theoretical as, and practical. And so I started with Orit Gidali because she writes a lot about the things I needed. She writes about practical things, what to say at the airport, how to talk to your kids, how to clean your house. And so <laughs> the first poem that I looked at was, Did You Pack It Yourself? Aratz Levad. I'm going to read it in Hebrew. And my accent, you'll notice, I can't do the reish. I do the reish like Spanish or like uh, the Czech. So when I do the rrr sound, you should really do it in your throat. And I just can't do that. So here I go. Aratzlavad. Mikol hashelot lishol. Aratzlavad? Ken lavad. Haya kashe amarti. Aval yote kashe lefahad sheze lo yebog farafam. אינני יפה, אתה מבין? וחלב הוא בגודל אגרוף. And here's the English. Did you pack it yourself? Of all the questions to ask, did you pack it yourself? Yes, by myself. It was hard, I said. But it's harder to fear that it will never come. 
I'm not beautiful, you see. And the heart is the size of a fist. Now, <laughs> it's such a simple little bitty poem. It's just a few lines. And all of her work is kind of like this. It sort of blows you away. It's really simple. And it doesn't contain any really crazy syntax or, or language. But what she does here, first of all, you have to know that the word levad is alone. It's like single. Are you single? Yeah, I'm levad. I'm single, right? Um, but it also means by yourself. So to translate that into English, I had to stick in that word by yourself instead of like, did you pack it single? Yes, I packed it single. Right? Uh -huh. And so... <laughs> And the, the collections that I did with Ori really follow a, a narrative arc. She has four books here and this packed up into this one. And it starts off as her young and, well, she's still young, but she's not married and she wants to meet her love and she's dreaming about all of that. And then later on, she does, in fact, these are kind of autobiographical. She does get married and raise a stepdaughter as her own and has three more children. And it takes us through um, being a stepmother, being a mother, um, her mother dying, and just the joys and challenges of marriage. And she's putting them all in a sort of biblical context as well, which is really kind of fun. So I wanted to read the poem at the one of the poems at the end and it's called I call to tell a friend that my mother is dying and I'll just read that one in English I moved apartments three times in three years it still beats buying in my opinion who knows how long this country will last the children the work there's never enough time I just called to hear your voice awful things are going on in the world how are you yeah, so th these poems, I, it, it struck me as how how um, simply they were written, but they all seem to have double meanings, like everywhere. Like that seems like the the central sort of aspect of um, of the poetry here, um, and which seems like it would be imp like impossible to translate. I mean, with all the you know, it seems like it's focused on the double meanings and the in the ways that, like you mentioned already, the difference between you know the different meanings of single. And the way that word can be used in the Hebrew, so so as a translator, how do you approach those kind of things? Like, do you, um, like, how close do you have to feel like you have to keep it to the original versus how much you you're free to play to make it feel more true to the the spirit of the original? How do you negotiate mm -hmm. that? It seems like, like there could be a thousand different translations of every poem, right? Yeah, and the funny thing is, is that the simpler the poem is, the harder it is to translate. Mm -hmm. Um, because they're based on language and the word plays you've pointed out. Um, what I did with Ulrit's um, work is, and, and really this is what I always do with the poetry, I don't, I don't try to overinterpret the poem. I like to give the reader as much of the original experience as they would have had had they read it in the original. So I don't like to predetermine meanings. If there are double meanings in Hebrew, I like there to be double meanings in English. If something's a little bit unclear, I don't want to jump in and answer the best answer. I, I like to keep it open. So each of these sections also has an appendix. Um, you know, if they're cultural references, I don't want to, to, to gloss them as, I, as I'm translating overly. Um, with these simpler poems, I feel like I didn't need a gloss for those. I felt like I tried to use, as you said, I tried to be as true to the meaning as possible. Sometimes you that meant I had to change a language a little bit, but not very much, like single and by myself. This one I called to tell a friend didn't really need me to change any language or any phrasing. The joke here is that, of course, you never mention the mother in the whole time. The whole thing is in the title. And um, this is a sort of a lot of this, though, draws on. It seems really simple and it seems very domestic and it seems very personal and individual. But a lot of this really does mirror the feeling of the state. Um, Gedali was born right after the Yom Kippur War in the, ni in 19, um, in the 1970s, and she um, she's writing in this feeling of anxiety. And so you get that in this last poem where, you know, 
yeah, prices are rising every single year and it's stupid not to buy something, right? But you never know, you know, this, there was the Gulf War where Iran was bombing Tel Aviv and you just never know. And so there's a whole Edgar Carrot writes about this as well. You know, at one point in one of his stories, they even quit cleaning the house and the light bulb goes out and they don't even replace it. And they just stop paying the water bill, you know, because like, all right, we're going to be bombed and we'd be feel stupid to have to pay rent, you know, <laughs> and so that's sort of the joke um, that that we're getting into here. I don't know how much time I we didn't really talk about how much time we have for each of these I think, guys. You know, if we have like 15 minutes for each of them. And so if you okay. wanted to read this last poem too, we could have lived so well, uh, you said, in days. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the reason I wanted to read this one is just because this one you're talking about, you know, how to translate this. This is where I did need the the appendix. Because this one really, really depends on your knowing the rules of Shabbat or the rules of rest. And it's and we're talking about the Sharon, and that's the plain of Sharon. This is where Tel Aviv is, the central part of Israel. And on Shabbat, you should not do any work. Now, what we mean by work is really biblically, it's what was work, what was used to build the temple. So you can't sow, you can't do agriculture, right? Um, you don't do, you don't burn fire, so you don't click on and off electricity and that kind of thing. It's supposed to be a time where you have your second soul enters and you're supposed to really just relax and enjoy. You're supposed to make people happy. You're supposed to be happy. You're supposed, it's a commandment. You should be happy on Shabbat. And so this kind of depends on that. And what I love about it is that she'll take these grand ideas and she just, it's almost it's almost silly. It's playful. It's fun. She puts them in these minuscule daily um, details. So let me let me read and you'll see what I mean. In a little while, Shabbat in the Sharon and the traffic lights take off their red and the laces unravel and yield to the barefoot and the records of the world gather into a book and rest from their anxiousness to break. And the change in the wallet emphasizes the victory of the many and the small. And the expiration dates on the milk do not threaten to be expired. And the first fruits are relaxing in sealed bags and the ice in the freezer assumes the shape of the most self-confident mold. And the styrofoam separates into small balls that do not need the practical. And the central air does not apologize for deceiving the heat. And the screens do not apologize for deceiving the brightness. And the poetry switches off the linoleum floor and switches on the ceiling. The adolescents are softer and are not putting off thank you. And what is piling up is piling up and what is split is split. And the clouds ponder the field and the field ponders the fish that float among the bushes in their imagination. And in the vineyards, grapes turn into raisins, others into wine. And not all the sweet ones are contaminated with maggots of worry. And he who asks for a deluge does not intend annihilation, but only a hard steaming rain. And the country leaders return from the road, gathering a family to themselves. And generosity is being seen as a quiet virtue and not for display. And mistakes are removed from the heart of things and the body's exchanges are just and the public domain is full of permissions and the private domains are full. And the fruits have set a tenth aside and do not miss the missing part, but are lighter. Sweetness is intensified. Every branch that crossbreeds exceeds to him with whom it was crossbred. And the bulbs open themselves to the outside and the bees imagine the honey and the trees get themselves a new king according to the vigor of their blooming. And the asphalt conquers the earth and liberates the best of her to the side of the road. And Tamar and Aman have moved into a pansy where they're making cakes out of the colors. And dust is withdrawing before the pollution. And every drizzle is a chance of a rainbow. And the green that is in the bushes almost overwhelms the leaves. And in the old people's lawn that surrounds you, the water sprinkles of winter open the water sprinklers of winter open, and indeed, there's suddenly a good southern wind. Only she doesn't answer when you ask, 
sparing you the nothingness, and her wrinkles multiply at once as if a little girl inside her were shrinking into herself. And your words glide on the slope of her nose when you lean on your cane, looking at her, looking at the blossoming, looking at the asphalt. We could have lived so well, you say, remembering the earth. And that was, uh, we could have lived so well, you say, and gaze at her, still pretty, um, mm -hmm. from this book um, by Orit Gadali. And um, so I, I wondered if, um, how... How is how is poetry in you know treated in Israel? Like how many you know readers would would Orik Gadali have um, in the actual no. Hebrew? Is it similar to the United States where it's sort of a more academic you know area of um, readership, or is it sort of have a wider audience? Do you have any I sense think of it that? Has a wider audience. I mean, Israelis will say, ah, yeah, poetry nobody reads, but honestly, that's not really true. Czech and, and Hebrew are both small languages, meaning there's about 8 million, 9 million native speakers in the country, maybe 10 million. So, you know, on the, on the new money, on the new shekels, there are poets oh, wow. and writers, right? Mm -hmm. So can you imagine like Toni Morrison being on the $20 <laughs> bill now? So <laughs> we have Leah Goldberg now um, on, on one of them. And so I think that, you know, even, even if, even if you hate it because you had to read it in, in high school, you still see it um, on bus stops. You know, sometimes in the bus shelters, there are poems. Um, it's used in the Ministry of Education to to talk about um, multiculturalism. And that's something, you know, some of uh, Eli Eliyahu's poetry will talk about next. Some of his work is used that way, too. Uh, a lot of poets um, also are not in academia. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, Ori teaches in communities around, and so she she has a pretty wide presence. Um, so does Sharon. She teaches classics. Eli Eliyahu who is an editor for Haaretz. And I think there's something about the fact that, you know, they have regular lives and regular jobs and they hang out with. I think that sort of helps as well. So I feel like poetry is a bit more mm -hmm. read here than in the States. I, I also wanted to ask before we move on um, to the next poet, how did you, how did you approach translating in the first place? Did you, it, it seems like, um, I always imagine that people who translate are like fluent in this language and love, a, a, you know, work of writing in certain language and then want to bring it into English. And it feels like while I'm, you know, not fluent in any languages, I can't do any translation, obviously. Um, but then I talked to A.M. Juster, and he's mm -hmm. been, he translates things from a whole bunch of languages that he barely speaks or looks you know can look up and read a little bit, but he goes through like a painstaking process of piecing together the way things were and asking people for help. Mm -hmm. um, and so how much how much of that like how did you end up translating these languages? Did you already speak them at the time, or did you learn as you went, or or um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it depends on each one. With Hebrew, I had studied a couple of years of biblical Hebrew and Aramaic before. And so I knew how the language was put together and I knew how it worked. And I knew when I started with Orit, you know, I had I'd been taking language classes um, in Israel as well. They have Upan where you can study. So I, I tested into like the intermediate level. So my problem always was that I understood it, but I really couldn't speak it very well when I first arrived. And I still don't speak it that great, but I, um, but I, I did Hebrew really as a learning tool. Um, and so with Orit Kidali and Eli Eliyahu, who both have um, simpler, that doesn't mean their poetry isn't good. It means that the language that they use, their, their, their playing field is a little bit more circumscribed. And so I would say this poetry it, it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but I think with poetry, you can translate it if you are translating it into the language in which you were very fluent mm -hmm. and you know very well. Um, for fiction, it's probably not worth it because you just have to know such a large vocabulary to make it worthwhile. The, the play here isn't really so much as these three words, how they play together on a page. It's really a large scope. So with poetry, I think it's much more important that you understand how poetry works and that you understand how the language that you're translating into works and that you understand how the grammar that you're translating out of works. Mm -hmm. The other day I was reading, I don't want to say what it was because 
poetry world small, but I was reading a poet that I'd so been looking forward to. Um, and a Serbian poet. And when I was reading the translation, I was thinking, oh man, I knew enough of the grammar of Slavic languages to understand what Serbian was trying to do. And I was like, whoa, they have translated this so literally that it just, I know what the poem says, but I don't know what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And so I think the really important thing to do when you're translating is just to know how the poem felt like and to be able to replicate that in English. So you you need a smaller vocabulary mm -hmm. because you can look up words. Right? That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't thought of that. So so would you recommend people who haven't tried to translate before try it? Do you think it's something that um, is, is worth just practicing as an exercise to learn more about poetry and and share more of what's going on in the world? Honestly, I think that that translating is the best close reading exercise you can possibly do. I wouldn't go to something that you have no idea how the structure of the language works. But, you know, if you don't know any other language and you're an English speaker, I would recommend doing a Germanic language, right? Um, and because you can, or, you know, or maybe a romantic language as well, because it's some of the language is close enough. Um, and and really just spend a lot of time with, with the thing. It's such a good close reading exercise, yeah. Um, sometimes I used to teach at American University translation and the policy there in the creative writing program was that every single creative writer had to take a translation course. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't speak the language, then you just got your native speaker buddy and you worked together like that. It was harder to do it that way, but it was absolutely amazing. And and people that started, you know, a lot of times it's it's a painful thing to do if you don't speak any language. It really, it really hurts. And so, um, but halfway through the semester, everybody was like, wow, this is the best class I've ever had because it's it's just so wonderful to to read a poem like this. So, yeah. yeah, yeah that sounds great. So hopefully everybody tries that out. Um, yeah. So the next poet we're going to move on to is um, Ellie Eli. Eli, Eli, Eli yeah. Who yeah. um, who we published? So readers of Rattle will recognize. Um, I think last summer we published um, one of your translations of, of um, yeah. Eli's work, and mm -hmm. um, and so do you want to start out introducing who the poet is? You mentioned already um, that he's a newspaper editor. Yeah, he is. He he edits for Haaretz, and Eli Eliyahu lives over in. Well, they all do actually. Everybody lives near me. Um, he lives in Givatain, which is just a little suburb right off of Tel Aviv, and he's an editor for Haaretz. And um, he is. All of these poets, I just they're just phenomenal, right? Israel has so many really really good poets. It's hard to to choose, and. I had made a, an I, I had decided when I came here that I just wanted to translate women because women, especially Israeli women, are just not translated, and I can't do Arabic, and, and they're the least translated Arabic language uh, women, and so I decided to do women. But when I found Eli Eliyahu's poetry, I loved it so much, so I made a deal with him that I would translate him if he translates into English some women, yeah. and he agreed, and um, and so. He is um, he is an Israeli writer of Iraqi descent. His parents were born in Baghdad and were removed um, during the expulsion of the Jews in um, Iraq. And so he writes a lot about that. His, he has three books, um, and they all are a little bit um, controversial. Well, the titles are a little controversial for Israel. They're all sort of based, well, they're not controversial, but they're all sort of based in Bible and and it's because he's not religious per se, but the family, his family is very traditional and his father loved telling Bibles. He talked about stories in the Bible as if they were happening today on the street, you know, like he'd come home from work and, and tell a story. And it was, he couldn't tell if, was that my neighbor or was that, you know, was that one of the prophets? And Babylon has actually got a very, very important place in, in the Bible with, with prophets and prophecies. You know, all the all the major prophets ended up in Babylon. And during the first Babylonian exile, which is where most of the, the families come from in Eli Eliyahu's as well. So, you know, they've lived their century, uh, millennia. And so these are very, very established um, families and very, very, the Jewish population was very established and in uh, Babylon and Baghdad. And so 
um, well, it's not Baghdad, but in, in the in the region. And so when when the when these particular Jews came to Israel, they had a very hard time because they were used to being like um, very well established in society, and then they come speaking Arabic to a country in which they are no longer, they, they, they're they living in poverty. A lot of them had to flee without any of their possessions and their properties and having to do manual labor. And it's life is very, very difficult. And on top of that, they're speaking Arabic when Israel is at war with Arab speaking countries. And so there's also in Israeli society a sort of split between the Mizrahi Jews, the Jews from the Arab speaking countries, and the Ashkenazi Jews, the Jews from the Yiddish speaking countries. Um, and so the Ashkenazi are sort of more, um, they have most of the cultural clout and the political power. And so Ellie. And, and there are movements like Ars Poetica um, that seek to address this by by they they write about social injustice and economic injustice and in these poets. But Ellie did something really interesting, I think, and he focused on the poet as a prophet figure or a figure of prophecy. And in this way, he sort of avoided getting into the fray that sort of divided along these terms of Ashkenaz versus Mizrahi. And in his poetry, I think he's just made all poets prophets. So all poets are Babylonian, all poets are Mizrahi, right? This is the standard. So it's not like it's measuring up against this white standard. No, he's he's staked, he's made his claim. Now, in his books, he's got... Um, I, he's got uh, I am not an angel, which is based on the um, Passover um, when the angel comes through and, and smites the, the Egyptians, right? Um, then he's got um, City and Fears, which is also a biblical passage. And then his last book is called Epistles to the Children. So he's branching out into the Christian gospels with this one. Um, so uh, the poems that I want to read today are really about his own background. And I find these very interesting. I wanted to say also, Ori Kidali writes a lot of motherhood poetry and Eli Eliyahu is one of the few poets in any language that I found that really writes father fatherhood poetry. Mm, focuses on being a father of small children, mm -hmm. of a small daughter. So I'm gonna read one about his father and then one about his daughter. This is underground. And you need to know that um, this one has a gloss also. Um, the quote, the, six, the operation was successful, but the patient died is like a stupid joke, like a dad joke, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> oh, the operation was successful, but the patient died. So he's using this phrase in the poem. And he's talking about being in an underground parking lot. But underground is, again, you know, you have a couple of different meanings here. Underground is also secret. Um, he's getting ready to be taken to the army. His father's getting ready to dr uh, drive him to the army. And his father's listening to an Arabic language station. But when he sees a son dressed up in his army fatigues, getting ready to take him, he has to quickly change the channel, right? So that's what the poem is about. Underground. And how can I help it if the operation was successful and Baghdad died? And nothing is left but the music my father would listen to on the stations of shame while waiting in the underground parking lot to drive me to the people's army on his way to work. And I'll never forget the sadness of his hand fumbling for the Hebrew to quickly switch before we'd leave and emerge above ground. Yeah, so that, that was underground from, and this book isn't available yet, right? It's uh, still in manuscript no, form? No, I'm hoping it's sitting with the publisher now who's supposed to get back. She's got COVID now, so hopefully it'll she'll feel better soon yeah I hope so. um yeah <laughs> um yeah but it's a, it's a wonderful book um and this is a the, one of the things i was thinking about reading um through um the, the first two books at least that we're sharing here is this like the double meaning of underground that you mention mm -hmm. um it, does it have the same is there a word um that has the same meaning in the hebrew and, and so it's just a sort of simple thing or did you have to find a word that somehow matches but i mean how much of that is your interjection of the english and well, how much was below, in the original? It's below the ground. Mm -hmm. And so 
I don't think the word itself is like underground, like secret, like in English, but the context is so clear that, mm -hmm. you know, I could have said below the ground, I could have said in the underground parking, us, you know, I could have said the secret. So this one just felt the most, this one felt underground that it was the, it offered the most choices for the reader. So you could read it straight. You could read it, you know, with the double, triple meanings. However, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just because underground is such a rich, um, you know, rich word, especially in mm -hmm. English, especially in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And so it uh, it was really interesting to see this poem. And, and it's exemplary of the, of the style um, of the poems in this book, which are, again, very tight and condensed and very seemingly simple, but very rich. I mean, they're over very quickly, and then you want to reread them like three times is how mm -hmm. his poetry goes. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, this book in particular, I have to say, it had been with another press for 18 months, and and the reader reports kept coming back positive, but there was always one. It's like, why did she translate it this way? You could translate it this way. And, you know, sometimes it was just counting syllables. You know, this line has five syllables in the original, and she has seven in her, you know, and it's just, mm -hmm. it gets to a point where sometimes translating the, the simpler poets, like I said earlier, is just harder. And translating small language is so, sometimes hard, too. Like, when you're translating German or French or Spanish, you know, everybody speaks those languages. And so, but when you're translating such a small language, everybody is like, Oh, I can read that too. You know, the people that can read it are really, and you know, with good reason, proud of it, because a lot of these are very difficult languages. So, in a, in another sense, it's harder. You have a smaller audience, but they're much more invested in it. So, they keep you on your toes here. Okay. Um, Stella Maris would be the next one, and and I just want to give also a shout out to Adriana X Jacobs because she's the one that introduced me to his work, and she's it. Um, she's at uh, Cambridge and she's, I'm um, sorry, Oxford. And she is super generous and very, very kind. And, and she showed me these poems originally. Um, so Stella Morris is the fatherhood poem that I'm talking about. And this one, I had a little bit of play as well, because when you're getting to the ship imagery, and the sea imagery. There are other poems as well where you could translate it as ocean or you could translate it as sea. And even though in Hebrew you have a distinction between the two words, but I really wanted sea. I wanted to keep the sea here because Tel Aviv and Jaffa both have ports. And if you keep the sea, then you have it specific. You know, just that one word can change this general feeling of, you know, anywhere there's water to, yeah, the Mediterranean coast with the ports. So Stella Maris. Like a drop of milk, the car slides down the nipple of the hill on my way to you, day old child, bundled in diapers of love, fourth floor, maternity ward B. In the window, blued from sea, ships unlatch from the mother port and launch into the unknown. And at last I know where I shall go. That was mm -hmm. Stella Maris by mm -hmm. um, Eli Eliyahu. Eliyahu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pronouncing that is, is difficult for me to know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, I just love this book. And um, mm -hmm. why don't we do, you had another one that you want to read goldfish. Do you want to do that one too? Yeah, you know, that's a little longer. Now this one I have to say is not, it, this one departs a little bit from his usual style, but I thought it was important because a lot of the poems in this book really do deal with father, with daughter, with prophecy and the role of poetry. But he also has a lot of soldier poems in here. And I thought the goldfish was an important poem because we haven't really addressed, you know, the idea of what could be, you know, hyper masculinity in a country in which everybody in the women too have to go to the army. And, and on one hand, it makes you really aware because like, you know, every, nobody here has problems with, with the idea that you need a license to shoot a gun and <laughs> that you have to be trained. But <laughs> on the other hand, though, there is this, I, I feel this poem is really, really interesting because it gets into the idea of groupthink and boys and, and the idea of masculinity and the idea of how to treat girls and women. And this is such a beautiful, sensitive poem. It's a little, and the tension is so 
amazing because it's so this is a prose poem and he's usually writing very very small poems this one fills out on the page she floated on her belly five or six boys circling her like a school of fish lunging for a bread crumb class trip the end of elementary school life wide blue and deep over their heads the only ceiling clear sky and the summer sticking sun knives into their flesh for most of them, this will be the last time they see each other. Tomorrow, the summer vacation will begin. After that, they'll be scattered among the different high schools in the town. One day, this class will be a distant, hazy memory. With faces blurred, the names mixed up, deeds confused with dreams and dreams with deeds. Things will have sunk to the bottom of the soul. She's a freckled girl, not especially pretty, but they are seeking neither beauty nor truth, not now. They are yearning for the pleasures of the skin, hungry for the nakedness of flesh. Her face is submerged in water. Every now and then she lifts her head to breathe. The breaths are sharp and fine as a needle. The beach is within shouting distance. They're holding her arms and legs and she's floating on her belly. They could reach their hands under the water and touch her feel her breast, her stomach, her thigh. They're laughing loudly. One doesn't know what the other's doing. Everything is hidden in the water. She wouldn't know who touched her and who demurred. Does she want them to touch her? They're painfully young. For the shy among them, it's a golden opportunity. Paupers who chanced upon a golden fish. A catch the sea has given them. It's probably the first time they get to touch a girl's body the budding breasts, the tenderness of her flesh. They feel the excitement of the blood in their veins and they laugh. The land is far off, far are the teachers. The parents are even farther. The sun is boiling in their skin. She's floating quietly as if it had nothing to do with her. They go to each other to touch her. Is one of them doing it? The water is dark and murky. Nothing is keeping them from touching. She's floating quietly. Maybe she'll think it's love. Is she smiling or crying? The water is misleading. The wind is deceptive. The waves are knocking and caressing. One of the boys is suddenly dizzy and he pulls back from the group. Is it me? Yeah, another mm -hmm. wonderful poem, that was Goldfish by Ellie Eliahu. And uh, from a forthcoming book, hopefully forthcoming soon. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to the next poet you wanted to share. I think it was Sharon Huss is the next one on the list. Yeah, yeah, Sharon Huss. Now she is very different from Eli Eliyahu and Sharon and um, Oriki Dali. She's very complicated, and there was no way in hell that I wanted to translate her. She, her sentences read like the syntax of German. She can go on and on for a whole page and a half in the single sing, um, sentence. Her vocabulary is incredibly complex. Um, and she is writing about ideas, not things. She's, a, she's trained in classics. And at first when I came upon her work, I met her at a party actually, and we were talking and I was telling her that I was, you know, who I was translating and she's like, oh, that's good. Um, Cause your Hebrew really isn't good enough to translate me. And I was like, no, I know. I don't even think anybody's Hebrew is good enough to translate you. <laughs> she's like, yeah, I know you should never try. And I was like, no, I never want to. And she's like, okay, so when are you going to do it? And I was like, I'm not. <laughs> so, uh, but Sharon is so smart and so lovely and so generous that I ended up doing it, even though I, it was totally irresponsible of me. I have no, I have no business doing this. Um, on the other hand, even though her, her syntax and her vocabulary is incredibly complex, her work is incredibly moving and she's really an important figure. She's one of these poet poets, like all the poets know her, all the poets read her, they all respect her. And she hasn't been translated that much into English. And I think, you know, considering the fact that she's won every single award you could possibly win in Israel, the Ami High Prize, the Bialik Prize, you know, like all of them. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows her and all the poets have, have trained on her. Um, but mostly I think it's because she writes book-length poems. 
So it's very hard to excerpt her work. Mm -hmm. And Zippy Keller has just now started. Um, she has a, a, a small portion of her work coming out. And so shout out to Zippy. Um, and that's going to be um, Zephyr Books. And it's going to be part of a three-part series. It's also going to be with um, with Norit Zahi and um, one more poet. I can't remember who. Um, but that's only 10 poets or eight poems. So I've translated Music of the Wide Lane, which is her penultimate book of poetry. And this one is fascinating. Sharon sort of had to reinvent certain aspects of the Hebrew language to suit her purposes. Um, at the time, there was no writing that talked about troubled relationships between mothers and daughters that talked about eros among women that talked about um philosophical ideas that are that we get from the greeks and the hellenistic uh, philosophers and so in a way i think some of her writing is complex because she just has to reinvent or invent not kind of invent the wheel mm -hmm. she says you know there were lots of poems about father daughters and there's lots of poems about men but not so much about what she was trying to write so this book is interesting because she's writing it from the point of view of a woman about to give birth to a son in a hospital with a father that's dying and in it her eye hebrew is a gender inflected language so not just the pronouns but the and nouns but the verbs take on a gender. Mm -hmm. So if I say I'm doing something, it's going to be a different gender than if somebody, if a man says it, that's in present and past tense. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to write, you know, in English, you could say I, and nobody knows what the gender is, but in Hebrew, you can't. And so sometimes what she's doing in this book is in one sentence, the verbs go from masculine to feminine to masculine. So it's a really wonderful, I was thinking about it. It's, it's not gender reassignment, it's more like a trans migration of gender or trans migration of soul. She's influenced by a poet called Yona Valak, who, and she said, reading Yona Valak, Yona Valak is very transgressive, and she has a poem called Hebrew is a Sex Maniac. And she talks about how you <laughs> Hebrew is always trying to see, you know, who's talking, what you look like. And, and so this is sort of what she's doing um, here at the same. So, let me just read because it sounds, let me just read and, and, and then we can talk about it a little more. Do, do you happen um, to have any um, in the Hebrew with you? Because um, I know with the mm. first poet, it was in the book, which made it easier, but um, a few yeah. people have asked. And it is nice to hear if you have have it with you, or, but if not, that's okay. You know what I can do is, what I will do is give you, I don't have, I have, but I don't have the diacritical marks in it. Mm -hmm. So... If you go, let me see if I can figure out a place. If you go to Poetry International, Rotterdam, mm -hmm. you can see, is there a chat box? Um, yeah. Well, there, well, there's several <laughs> because we have, we're streaming a lot of different places. But uh, yeah. Okay. I don't know if I have access to one. Uh, you don't, no. Okay. So you can go to Poetry International, Rotterdam, which is a site that Lisa Katz has been curating for the is for the Hebrew language poetry mm -hmm. and you can see her work with diacritical marks in it um, not the poems that I'm going to read here mm -hmm. but you can see some of them I also some of these have appeared in two lines but I don't two lines might actually have some of these um, in bilingual so if if one of the listeners can look up two lines and Sharon Ass, H A S S, and um, the it would be dinner with Joachim or thefts, and see if those are bilingual. Um, so I'll just I'll read it in English, mm -hmm. in a voice that isn't mine, but not exactly anyone else's either. I try the impossibility that is open to me. And it's not a gate or mirror or sea. The page, which isn't a page anymore, flickering electrons, a curtain without folds, rising, restless white, the syntax, witness to the tectonic language and the necessary unknown to me hits 
the poem. Is it the form that surplus can take? A shining winged creature? A kind of mantle to hide in? Or the miracle of a mask that you don't remember and touch in surprise and the face falls? Chance again tries your nerves. It wants to be called fate. Sleepless nights when the bed is a river or a pit. You will change faces and you will be unrecognizable. Grief will be royal jelly in the morning. Who is the one who without motion traversed the night and stood beside the sun? Sawdust and broken bottles, almost a girl washing her face. Belief doesn't believe in the capricious wing tales, talents. Um, you can see this, the, the richness of that um, just yeah. in, in the translation, but um, it's hard to imagine how you would go about translating something where the verbs are gendered and that, and that, and that is part of the meaning um, in the poem. That, that's incredible. This one took a very long time. Um, it took two years or so. And I met with Sharon almost weekly. And I sat with her and I was like, okay, you mean Zohar, or do you mean Radiance, or do you mean the Kabbalah Zohar, or do you mean, are you talking about string theory? Because she is talking about string theory. <laughs> she's this beautiful, in one place, she's she's referencing other Greek stories in which there are, there's grief. So Penelope and other weavers and so she's doing this beautiful thing of, of using the idea of text and textiles and weaving and and connecting that with the string theory of the different strands and strings of time space. And so she is inhabiting the book. This section is called He Has No Name. Right. And it's all one word. He has no name. And it really is a sort of voice that's channeling all the souls that came before the ones that are coming after the one in her womb her father but it's it's not just a chaotic mess she's she's here she's placing herself in this room and so it's incredibly moving and it it depends so i spent a lot of time like i read up on string theory and quantum physics and i read up on weaving and um and Anat Hinkas, who's here in Tel Aviv, helped me as well. And luckily, I had the, the NEA grant, so I, you know, hire help here because it's really it was really an education. Yeah. Well, I don't know how you have just time. You must have uh, used string theory to clone yourself or something. <laughs> I don't know how you have time to do all these different translations as well as your own work and teaching. I, I don't know. It's it's just really impressive. Um, in addition, my floor, just, yeah. My floor is a mess. I just don't mop my floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's hear. We we should keep moving on, but um, maybe All one right. more poem from uh, from Sharon. Okay, um, this is this is one long. I'm just gonna read a couple of. These are all sequence. It's all one long poem. So I'm just gonna read a couple of sequences. I want to put in one about the mother and then the poetry. Yesterday, she devoured my kitchen, grabbed the latke, strode to the fridge, pulled out a jar of something salty, the bread she almost threw into the garbage when she saw it. How the hell does one make toast around here? Stabbed a spoon into the chocolate spread, threw two olives into her mouth. Maybe there was a thrashing fish as well, I can't remember. In the middle of a wrecked world, my mother sat and chewed. And no, I didn't have any idea what a table was. That entity upon which philosophers hit, for examples. Again, I had to invent the wheel and move ahead, erect, as if the path itself were a step, followed by a step, forward, not backwards, not spiraling, forward. Surely somewhere there's a center, calm, lit, around which we are toddling. If only now we'd learn to walk. And I'm going to skip over to the last section where you have that mixing of genders here. He wakes with great difficulty. He's an orphan girl who has no, no model for orphanhood. Her hope is not for what is possible, like the resurrection. Her desire is another impossibility, that the trees return to the trees and the light to rustle, the snake to rest its tail in its mouth, 
and she will see and she will hear the unbearable in the inconsolable and the what has no form to hold it, death. She has clearly seen disappearing behind an open door. Okay. Yeah, that is beautiful, beautiful poetry mm -hmm. there. Um, yeah. and, and so so rich and, I don't know, so different than the other two poets, which is really fascinating too. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, not when we're still seeking a publisher. So if anybody wants to, to take that, just contact me. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Yeah, that's, um, Marcella, she like <laughs> com is her website to contact her. Please do. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't find that poem in the manuscript fast enough, so people didn't get to see it. Yeah. But, uh, but oh, okay. beautiful, beautiful to hear. Um, let's let's mm -hmm. move to the next one. So we have, um, I think, the the Czech fairy tales or the next. Yeah, let's do some Czech fairy tales. Now, it's it's nice to transition actually from Sharon to this, and really from all of them because Eli Eliyahu does it too. You know, we don't make up new stories. We tell the same stories over and over. And Sharon is doing this too. She's taking these ideas that are, you know, from the Greeks and from the Bible and from, and just retelling them in today's world. And so with the Czechs, as I said before, these are two of the foundational, Karl Henek Macha and Karol Jaromel Erben are two of the foundational poets of the Czech Renaissance, the, the revival of the Czech languages in the 19th century. So... Basically, um, Erben was a librarian, and he had access to um, all of these wonderful stories. He worked in Prague in the city museum and the city library, and he the idea of the romantics is that the country folk were the simplest and the truest and the closest to wisdom and nature and God because they weren't corrupted by city life. Also, they spoke Czech because they weren't working in the municipalities. And so um, a lot of times, uh, Erben would collect these stories from the countryside. You know, again, even fairy tales and folk stories aren't just from one region. So a lot of these have their beginnings in, they're shared, they have a shared European uh, story and some even go back to the Greeks. But what I like about Czech fairy tales or I don't like about Czech fairy tales, I haven't decided yet, is that it's extremely proletariat. These were written during the period, the an agra agrarian society. Women, women were weavers, and this was their household income. And so you will never see a princess marry a prince and then stop doing housework like in Cinderella. Mm -hmm. The queen <laughs> will still continue to weave, okay? So... <laughs> yeah, I was, in, I was interested in that because um, I just yeah. recently learned, somebody was telling me that... Um, it just pointed out that all of the words we have spinning yarn, weaving a tail all come from that act of, um, of, of weaving and making in the home. It was a way to pass the time where how these fairy tales through the oral tradition were passed down. And so it became in a, a part of our vocabulary, which is just, I, I don't know how that I never noticed that, but I never did. <laughs> yeah. So this is a wonderful transition from Sharon Miles to, um, now. So I'm going to talk about this. So these poems um, this is a beautiful edition. It's Twisted Spoon Press, who do beautiful work. And Alish Divis did the... Can you see? Because I don't... Okay. Yeah, he see. did the illustrations. And this one is... And a lot of these were put to music. They're ballads. And they were put to music by Dvorak um, and others. So this is the wedding shirt. They're very, very musical. So for this one, I kept the rhyme and the meter as much as possible. Eleven o'clock has come and gone, and still a lamp is shining on, and still a lamp is burning there, suspended over a kneeler. On a wall of the lowly room, a little bud and rose and bloom was the holy family hung, the parents of God and their son. Before the image of those three, a young girl prays on bended knee. Her head is bowed, her hands are crossed, her hands are crossed over her breast. Tears are streaming from her eyes. Her chest is heaving, then she sighs, and when the hovering tear drops down, it falls on her soft white gown. Oh, dear God, where is my daddy? Grass is growing on his body. Oh, dear God, where is my mother? There she lies next to my father. My sister didn't live a year. A bullet killed my brother. I'm so unhappy. Once I had a lover, but he's gone abroad and still has not returned, and I would have given him my life. Before he left, he dried my eyes, comforted me with this advice. 
Sow flax, my dear, sow flax in May. Say you'll think of me each day. Mind the spinning that first year, then wet the cloth beside the weir. Stitch the shirts in the third year. When the sewing is complete, weave some flowers into a wreath. I've sewn the shirts and done my best. I've stored them in a wooden chest. The flowers now have dried and curled. My love still wanders through the world. The wide, wide world, he's lost and free, like a stone in the deep sea. Three years without a word of news. Does he live? Is he well? Only God knows. Almighty Virgin Mary, please give me strength. Oh, please help me. If my love's lost in foreign charms, bring him back into my arms. He's the only flower I have left. Give him back or give me death. With him, the world is spring and bloom. Without him, all is winter gloom. Loving mother, dear Mary, help me now in all my grief. The picture on the wall then stirs. The young girl screams in terror. The lamp, which threw dim rays about, sputters once and then goes out. Perhaps it was a draft of wind or else an evil woman. Listen, on the porch's step and at the window, tap. Tap, tap. Are you sleeping or awake, my dear? Hey, my doll, I'm here, I'm here. Hey, my doll, how are you? Have you remembered, are you true? Or does another love you? Oh, my love, thank God, my dear. I was thinking of you now at prayer. At this time, I think of you and say a prayer here at this pew. Ha, stop praying and let's go. I'll lead and you follow. The moon will light on our way tonight for I've returned to claim my bride. What are you saying? For God's sake, where would we go now? It's so late. The wind is roaring anyway. It's almost daylight. Come, let's wait. Oh, night is day and day is night. By day a dream presses my eyes. Before the roosters are awake, you'll be my bride, the bride I'll take. Don't hesitate. Rise up and come. I must take you, make you my own. The darkness is profound that night. From the heights the moon shines bright. Desolate, the silent, silent village, nothing there but the wind's wild rage. He goes before her leap by leap. She follows after step by step. The village dogs begin to howl as when they smell something foul or strange, like strangers on the fly, or when they sense a corpse nearby. I will stop here, but this is a really fabulous horror story. It really is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish it was a, a nighttime episode here so we could get the, the creepy vibe, but it's in the morning, which I makes it a little know. less, less it's horror. Really <laughs> and the D.V. Swod, uh illustrations are absolutely amazing. He wrote those while in a mental institute, uh, institution and he was oh, during the Soviet period and he was, uh, oh, they're fabulous. Yeah, I have one up on the screen. I think that goes with this. Uh, this uh, Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just ladies, for your own benefit, don't ever get married in the middle of a night. <laughs> somebody you haven't seen in three years. Yeah, probably, um, probably not a good idea. <laughs> um, it's funny because these aren't all horror stories, but, you know, they don't really end well for women in these books. And um, this this collection, I don't really think it's that that Czechs are misogynist because they're not. But I just think that women were so powerful. I mean, the first Czech queen was a woman. I mean, the first Czech ruler was mm -hmm. a woman, um, and Libushe. And so I think the idea here is that women do have a lot of power. And so they are sort of used to teach moral lessons to people. And so a lot of these women in, in this collection suffer. Some of them are redeemed. A lot of them are redeemed. Um, but they're all strong. They're all strong women. And how did you, yeah. how did you find yourself translating this collection? Um, what, what drew you to it or, or how did that oh, process happen? So my grandparents spoke Czech at home and I lived near them. I saw them every single day. My parents learned English in school. So I grew up with some of these ideas. Now they came, you know, before, they came during this Habsburg monarch period to Texas. And so they had, you know, they, they weren't, um, they didn't speak proper Czech, but they, they spoke more like the countryside. And so I grew up hearing a lot of these stories. Um, the noon witch, which I won't read here, there was a witch and in my grandparents' house. And if we weren't good, she would come get us. Oh, wow. And, uh, <laughs> 
And a lot of the traditions here were still there because, you know, it's, I guess it's like the, the, the Amish or the, you know, the, the Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, the, the old families that moved over and then they kept the old time traditions. And so when I first came to Czech Republic and I was 25 and I was teaching in a gymnasium and my students, they were really into this stuff. And so I was too. And, and, and we kind of read them together. That's how I started. Because right? of my students in Biskupske Gymnasium and Chesky Budio would say. So. Uh, do you want to share? I don't know. Do you want to share anything else from uh, from this book? Um, um, maybe just a little, little bit from Water Sprite. It's okay. the most famous one, Vodnik. It's about this. There are lots and lots of rivers and lakes in the Czech lands. Um, there are like 200 lakes in Lipno and South Bohemia. And it's just a country that it's landlocked, but there's a lot of fishing and a lot of water. And so one of the national folk figures is a is a water sprite. And you can actually see people dressing up like him sometimes. You know, like you have Renaissance fairs in the States. You have like Vodnik people that dress up and, and they hang out. And, um, and so... Well, I guess during festivals, not just like every day, but uh, this one is a beautiful, the rhythms are so gorgeous. I'm just going to read a little bit. The, the water sprite sits near a, a body of, of water and tries to lure you into the, to the lake and steal your soul. But if you're a beautiful girl, he wants to marry you then and, and take you down and you live forever down there. Kind of like Persephone, right? Mm. Over the lake in a poplar tree sat a sprite one evening. Shine, sweet moonlight, shine, I stitch a dainty line. I sew, I sew me little boots to wear in wet and dry pursuits. Shine, sweet moonlight, shine, I stitch a dainty line. Today is Thursday, Friday's next, I sew a jacket with a vest. Shine, sweet moonlight, shine, I stitch a dainty line. Green suit with boots of cherry, tomorrow I will marry. Sweet, shine, sweet moonlight, shine. I stitch a dainty line. At dawn, the young girl rose, made a bundle of her clothes. At the lake, my mother sweet, I'll make my clothing clean and neat. Oh no, sweet child, not to the water. Stay home today, my little daughter. A strange dream came to me last night. Oh, stay inside and out of sight. I chose pearls for you last night and dressed you in a gown of white, made of froth and foam. My dear, don't go outside. Stay with me here. White cloak sadness, heed my fears, and pearls are soft and round as tears, and Friday's an unlucky day. Don't go outside, my daughter, stay. She's so restless, restless daughter. Something draws her to the water, to the water. Nothing she knows, nothing she longs for. Still she goes. Yeah, that is this, I love the rhythm of that. And then here we see another one of those um, um, paintings. But um, but what, what what beautiful rhythm? Um, how is that? Is that in the original? Like like I don't know. How yeah, do you... it's really beautiful. Yeah. This is why Dvorak called them symphonic uh, poem. He wrote his symphonic poems. You can hear them. It's really really beautiful in the yeah. original. And it was really hard. I just broke my teeth on this one because I wanted, you'll see with, with Macha, I could not keep the rhyme and the rhythm without making it sound like a Hallmark card. So I didn't, uh -huh. but with Erben, it ju I just had to. And so I spent so much time um, really just trying. It was very hard. I didn't want to invert the sentence structure. Um, I wanted to make it sound, you know, normal. And it's it reads just like that in Czech. Yep. Wow, that's that's amazing. Um, yep. So so we're kind of running up on time, but we have one more um, um, translation we wanted to share, which was Maka. Yeah, and I'll just be brief with this one. This one is interesting for these rhythms that we're talking about. This is kind of how it started. Karl Henrik Maka. He wrote a book called May and My. And this was really the first successful or the first good book in Czech. <laughs> Poetry. There were lots of bad ones, and not lots, but you know, at the time of the of the Pan Slavic revival, the Slavic revival, there, you know, the idea here, Czechia was not a fancy country, right? <laughs> you had they didn't, they weren't really that many. The the aristocrats and the and the kings and stuff were all foreign. They were seen as foreigners. And so the Czechs themselves prided themselves on being proletarian or work or you wouldn't use proletariat at this time, but 
but common people, uh, people of the countryside, um, and they shared an aesthetic of love, cooperation, brotherhood, you know, communist kind of stuff or before the communists. I wouldn't call it, I would call it more communal because Soviet stuff didn't fly very well over there. But this guy, I'm going to say, died. He he was kind of scandalous. Carl Hennig Mach, he died at 26 like a good romantic poet should. And But he was kind of scandalous for his own personal life. But the thing that really made everyone really upset was this book because he used bourgeois foreign rhythms. He used iambic meter, which was terrible. And I, it's wonderful now, but I want to show you what that means. And I'll read a little bit from checks just so you hear what the, the rhythm, the first poem rhythms were like. It's like a march. It's like a political protest. So he wrote this beautiful, gorgeous, flowy poem, and it was sort of scandalous because it involved patricide, romantic things, and, and, and it had a foreign meter. And so he wrote this dedication, and I feel like he did it sarcastically because of the content and the, and the rhythm. Here it goes. Chekove so naro dobri, ne sjasni yenj nozi kal, nechte v Chekove obrati, ten mui riklo pomotta, biti chechu ni ne pratelim, nes, I hate this word, nes jasti chech jehovin, Chekove so naro dobri, ati chechu vierni sin. You see, it's like a car. <laughs> Czechs are a great nation. The unfortunate who cries in distress, let him to the Czech petition. He will quickly give him assistance. Even if he be Czech's enemy, the Czech does not begrudge his wrong. The Czechs are a good nation, and you, the Czech's true son. And the refrain is, true son and brother ours, you have the Czech's good heart. Right? That's just horrible. So he, <laughs> he wrote, <laughs> then he went back to business, and he wrote his beautiful romantic uh, poem, and you can hear the rhythm is very, very different. Bil pozni becher parvni mai, becher ni mai, bil laski chas. Her lichens val ku lasse laske de boro be zabon yel hai. O lasse sheptel tihi mech, kvetotsi strom hal laski gel. Svo lasku slavi kruji piel, rujino yevil voni stek. I'll end there. Voni stek. And um, so the rhythm is very, very different, and here it is in English. It was late evening, first of May. Was evening May the time for love? The turtle dove invited love to where the pine grove's fragrance lay. The silent moss murmured of love. The flowering tree belied love's woe. The nightingale sang rose-filled love. The rose exhaled a sweet complaint. The placid lake and shadowed thicket resounded darkly, secret pain. And I'll go on a little bit more. Embracing it within its shores, its pristine sons of other worlds were wandering through the sky's blue band as fiery as the lover's tears. So you see, it's, it's, it's very different. And uh, Maha read Byron, and he read... The, he could read German, and, and I guess he read Byron in German translation. And so he he walked a lot, like all the romantics. He took these long meanders through the countryside, and they had a lot of Italian um, travel journals. And so he would read those. And so a lot of the, the landscape is a kind of blend of an Italian villa and a Czech. I mean, you know, they would spend the night in castle ruins and that kind of thing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think, I mean, we're just out of time, but it's just been wonderful talking to you about, I mean, we, we crammed so much into this, uh, this I hour. Know. And, uh, and everybody doesn't have whiplash. <laughs> this is really crazy. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't wait to listen to it again so I can um, enjoy it more, but um, just so much great work here and, and also eclectic as it moves, you know, through different styles and forms and, and all with something really cool to add. Those last two books, I should say, are from Twisted Spoon Press and are still available. So find them mm -hmm. at twistedspoon.com. 
Um, and I have to say, these books are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, they do a beautiful job. You just want to touch them. You're like They're a great size. They have beautiful illustrations. The paper's wonderful. It's just a piece of art. I'm so lucky. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very cool. And then the other books are available. Um, you know, the ones that are out, the, the what, um, Sharon Haas? <laughs> Is that Press, yeah? yeah. <laughs> and um, and then the other two are going to be coming out eventually, I'm sure. So we'll all keep an eye out, and I'll I'll share the news when they come out and are available. Um, but Thank but Marcella, thanks so much for being a guest. It was just as much fun as last time, and just so much great great work you've done here. Thanks so much. It's such a pleasure. Yeah. Have a, have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye. Yes, yeah, so that was Marcella Shulak, and um, her website is marcellashulak.com that is spelled m-a-r-c-e-l-a-s-u-l-a-k.com marcellashulak.com I'll, I'll put it on the screen here this is her website and um so find all of all of her translation books and then of course her other poetry books are um uh, the ones we talked about last time in episode 107 which is city of skyscrapers which were those um um yeah, beautiful book there. And then there's Decency, there's Immigrant, there's Mouth of Seeds, which I think is over on the f on the on the um, nonfiction page, perhaps. Yeah, there's Mouthful of Seeds. So there's so much great work. That's from Black Lawrence Press. So go to MarcellaShulak.com for more on all of those things. And um, and thanks to her for being a guest twice. It's really really cool to get to see all the things that she's doing. Um, now we're going to take a quick break and go to the open lines. And uh, the prompt for this week was to write an echo verse poem. So if you have your echo verse poems, have them ready. Um, I'll put the thing up on the screen to tell you how to do all this. So if you, oops, this is the wrong one. Right there. So if you'd like to uh, share a poem, and it can be an echo verse poem for the prompt for this week. It could be a news poem about current events. It can be a poem that you published recently and are just proud of and would like to share, especially if you have a link that's really cool to show off other magazines when they're online. Um, whatever you'd like to share, please do. Just email it to openmic, that's openmic at rattle.com right now so I have it and can pull it up on the screen um, as you read. And then call in. You can pick one or the other if you'd like to call in over video so we can see you too. It's uh, Rattle Poetry, all one word on Skype. So just go to Skype, open your Skype up, type uh, Rattle Poetry, all one word, and then say, hey, I want to read a poem in the chat window. I will call you within the next hour when it's your turn. If you'd like to call in by phone, the number is 818-850-7727. That's 818-850-7727. Just let it ring a few times, then hang up, and I will see the number on my call screen, know you want to read, and call you back in the next hour. So pick one or the other, and feel free to join me in just a little bit. I'm going to take a brief break, stretch a little bit, get things set up, and I will be right back. Thanks so much for your patience as I stand and stretch a little bit. That was a great episode, I thought. I mean, it was nice, too, to have one where I could just take a back seat and let Marcella go after last week's, which was a bit of a, a wrestling match or something. Um, that was a nice, easy one for me, and I get to learn so much. I mean, I, I skimmed some of these books, but I couldn't read them all, of course. And then hearing her explanations and, and the beautiful rhythms of the language and how different they all were it was just fascinating stuff. I hope some people pick up some copies of those books. Um, so the prompt for this week, like I said, was to write an echo verse poem. And that is a poem where um, there's an echo, the, the, there's a rhyme at the very end of each line. There's like a, 
a repeat rhyme there. And I didn't finish my poem, although I have one. And so my New Year's resolution, if you remember, was to not not phone poems in really quick and just uh, if I have a poem going, I'm going to finish it and write it all the way. Didn't quite finish it, so I'm going to read it next week, I think. Um, but uh, Megan has a poem here. This is Winter Walk, which she managed to complete. This was a tough form, actually. I think I would have finished my poem this week if it wasn't for the form, but I kept getting tripped up a little bit. You know, some lines move through really easily, and then some were hard to find a way to make them fit this form. And um, But it worked perfectly for the topic, which I won't even tell you what it is. But next week, it's also a news poem um, that I wrote, and it will be qualified. It was news that happened Thursday, so I could still submit it to Poet Respond up until this Thursday to qualify as a Poet Respond poem. Uh, but here's Megan's poem, Winter Walk, which she managed to pull off really well, like she always does, because she's Megan. What can you do? And here is uh, Megan's poem, Winter Walk. Oops. Winter Walk. There are faces in the snow. No, only shadow and a lonely mind. Mind the ice on the path, slick as a new baby. Baby, you once told me, let me warm you up. Up in the trees, a broken birdhouse, house to nobody now except the termites. Might you be lost in the snow, alone now too? To call you would be a mistake. Take each step carefully, take it easy. Easy to fall when there's ice beneath you. You said you were winter and I was July. Lie to me, smooth as a frozen sea. See? That is Megan's poem, Winter Walk, for today. And now let's see what you have for us. We have Patricia Casey, we have T.R. Paulson, um, we have Joan... Leota, we have Dick Westheimer, Jerry Stephenson, Nivita Karthik. Um, let's call up T.R. Paulson, who hasn't been on in a while. Then we'll do Nivy because it's late in India. Then we'll um, we get Patricia Casey. Um, yeah, well, Carolyn Codd's here, Bev Wendell Atherstone. We have a 910 that looks like a new number. Um, Joan Liotta is new too, I think. I mean, it's a name that I recognize. I don't think she's been on the show before. Um, anyway, so one thing I should say that when you call in, um, it's going to sort of come out of nowhere and surprise you because there's a 30 second or so, 20 second maybe delay. So it's going to surprise you, but be ready um, and shut off your stream or at least mute it. But shutting it off completely is better so that you uh, don't get confused by the two voices in your head. So turn down the volume there and also have the poem ready to read because you can't read it off the screen. It's at a different time. So you'll be not to the part yet where you're showing the poem when you're trying to read it. It doesn't work. So have the poem in front of you when you're ready. If you're a first time caller, um, just a warning about all that. Let's call about T.R. Paulson first. And T.R. has got a sonnet for us today. Hey, T.R. How you doing? Hey, um, I don't think you can see me because uh, I have to do my touch ID. There, now can you see me? No. Uh, not yet. I think you have to hit the camera button if you want to be on screen. It's like between the hang up and the mute. It seems like they change everything every time. <laughs> All these companies do. And in fact, um, I mean, I couldn't get to any of the comments anyway today because we were going through so much stuff. But um, but I couldn't have even if I tried because you Facebook locked me out of Facebook. I'm like banned from Facebook for they said I was doing things too fast or something. And so I have an hour long ban. Um, so I can't even look at Facebook, which is weird. Um, but I think it's still running. So yeah, I'm going more <laughs> to YouTube now than I used to. Yeah, the, the, yeah. I mean, Facebook, I don't know what they're doing, but they're not doing well lately. <laughs> they used to be, <laughs> you know, two years ago, it was the best place to do this. They had a lot of, they were trying to push video. And so they were really pushing, um, to, you know, to our, to, you know, 25,000 people who who are like our page, like maybe 1,000 see every post, but they were pushing videos to like two, 3,000 people. And now they're not. So I don't know. So Facebook is just... They're pushing the people that pay them more money. And yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, yeah. us poets are not rich. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So what do you have to share with us? It is a sonnet, and it says it's from Trajectory. Yeah, um, here is Trajectory. Oh, very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, they, as you can see, they do a... Well, you can't see very well. You can kind of sort of see. They do a beautiful job of putting together a journal. but And they also have an online presence at Trajectory. I believe it's trajectoryjournal.com. 
Um, but this was like the third issue they ever put out. And it, so my poem is not online um, because they only started with 2015 or so. And this is from 2011. Um, so it's print only. And I, like I, I think I told you a couple of weeks ago, I've been trying to put together my manuscript and I've gone through all my published poems. And it's kind of sad that some of them are, you know, technically published, but nobody can will ever be able to find them unless they're actually in my book. So I'm really trying to push hard to get the ones that are only in print journals into my manuscript. Yeah, so, it's weird. It, it's weird how um, people seem to prefer print still. They're like, there's some kind of like feeling of being in a book that everybody loves, and and but the online lasts forever if you can keep it online, and so it it sort of has more of an audience online at this point. Yeah, except it's funny, like among my coworkers, I work for UPS, among mm -hmm. my coworkers, I would tell them about my online journal, online poems, and they're ju they just sort of scoff and say whatever. But the first time I was in a print issue of Rattle, mm -hmm. like, I guess it's been two years now, um, like I got a bunch at the um, contributor price that you offer, and I was just get, sort of giving them out, and workers, like coworkers who would scoff at the idea of online oh yeah i want a, i want a copy of the actual <laughs> print journal uh -huh, yeah. so yeah i think there's some so even among non-poets there's some sort of a stigma against yeah. oh it's online it's free it must not be any good kind well, of there's thing. like a mystique to print just in general i think that like the you know the tangibleness of it makes us feel it's weird it's it's a weird dichotomy because you do get more readers i mean even with rattle you know, we have 8,000 or so subscribers, but even so, more people read it online than, than in, actually in print. But the print feels um, more substantial or something just because of the way we, we think about it, I guess. Yeah, I guess it just depends on the audience because, like, my family, half my family won't even order stuff that <laughs> is in print. Mm -hmm. But they'll click on something, a link I sent them. So yeah. I guess, I don't know. It's it's weird. It is. Yeah, it's a weird transitional phase we're in right now. But let's hear this poem. This is In the Paddock. It's a sonnet. And I have it ready yep. whenever you are. In the paddock, behind the old wooden arena, now converted to a place where wheelchair-bound kids walk astride horses once husky, a dappled stallion grazes. He used to dance, a cloud of smoke, a muscled vessel in the evenings, just one of many Hanoverian horses. Now he stands alone. Don Chatterley, his owner, still lives here in Pleasant Springs, behind the bowling alley, she drifts from room to room, veiled by blue ruffled curtains, haunted by the voice of God. Her furrowed face, once pretty, now forgotten. Some say she's crazy. Look at the stallion. See the hollows above his black eyes. A tree forms streaky shadows on his face. Oh, that was beautiful. I always love a good sonnet. And that was a good one. Uh, thanks for sharing that, TR. Yep. Um, have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. And great Have to see fun you. reading those chat books. That <laughs> oh, I'm going to get started. Yeah, we have about 2,000 books to read over the next two months. So, Is it just 2,000? Usually it's like 3,000. Oh, no, for the chat book, that's about... I, I, I'm always hoping we get over the 2,000 mark. That's sort of the goal. And so we got like 2,050 or something this year. Oh, so my odds one one in 2,000, not one in 3,000. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, there you go. You might be thinking of the the, po the single poem contest gets more. Um, you know, it's funny. I intentionally chose one that's not in the chat book cause, cause, cause I, to read today because I'm in, like, I don't want to screw up my, the anonymous reading yeah, of it. Yeah, actually, the poem that we have coming up, it's actually going to be Wednesday, which is weird, um, was in a chat book that someone submitted, and I accepted it, and then because he, he just wrote it and made the chat book this week. And, um, and I said, well, you have to resubmit a new chapbook without that poem in it. So, so that's what he had to do. But um, it, this is a weird time of year for us always with these chapbooks. But, but anyway, it's great to see you, TR. Yep. Have a great day. Yep. yep, have a great day. There's TR Paulson with In the Paddock from Trajectory. Um, and Trajectory Journal is here. She was right. It was trajectoryjournal.com. You can see it kind of here, Trajectory Journal. And um, okay, now let's call up. Let's call up Nivedita because it's very late where she is. Hello. Hey, Nivedita, how are you doing today? Hey, Tim, I'm doing great, thank you. How about you? I'm doing great, and it's great to see you. Um, so, what do you have? You want to share two poems, I assume, and one's probably a prompt, and one's probably a funny news poem, right? Funny news poem, yes. Yeah. Prompt, not so much. Uh, was, was had a, a really busy work week. Uh -huh. 
I started to write a prompt poem, but didn't really find the time to complete it. So this is also sort of a new story poem. I read a new story in, I think it was BBC about 10 or so days back, which said that the rate of suicide among married Indian women is like among the highest in the world or something. And that really got me thinking. And that's what the one of the poems is about. And the second one is, of course, the, the funny news poem that I always do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's a sad story. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, so which one? Let's see. Is it too much? Is that the poem? Yeah, that's that's the sort of sad poem. Okay. So it's basically like in India, it's it's very rare to see nuclear families joint families are the norm here mm -hmm. so people live with their in-laws and not just their in-laws probably sometimes even like sister-in-laws brother-in-laws and their families so sometimes it can get too much for the women which is why i guess because they don't have any way for their voice to be heard oh yeah i can imagine so, that yeah it would feel very like smothering at all times exactly mm -hmm. and you can't do what you want to do and there's 20 people telling you 20 different things and you don't don't really know what to do. And I think that could be the cause for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, for years, this hasn't been a problem, I guess, with the changing the generations. This is now turning to be a problem. So I know we should we should see where this goes. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's hear it. This is, is it too much? Go ahead. Is it too much? Tongues may work with the widening of eyes when hearing the story behind her muffled cries from the toilet, you see. For she can't cry out loud, as it's against the rules to make a sound. What have they done to make you cry? Did they ask for money, or were their requests sky high? All they did was ask for you to cook some food, and make you wear clothes in colour suiting their mood. They also requested you never talk back, even if what they wished for was verging on the unreasonable track. Oh, and of course, comb your head this way, not that, and never ever show your emotions like a spoiled brat. Then says that your clothes are too thick to dry in winter and very unsuited for summer, and seeing your unsmiling face is such a bummer. You were asked to stop working, naturally, as it was getting in the way of all the tasks they'd assigned for you. The house is never clean without constant care. So, when they said you could work, they meant it, but just for an hour here and there. So is it any wonder that she cries soft and low? For each step she takes has become such a chore that her dreams too are filled with a thousand buzzing gnats, which cause in her universe a perpetual glitch she just can't seem to flee. No matter how much she tries, withstand she must each and every blow. Oh wow, very very moving poem, um, Nivedita. That was you really captured it very well. I think the the, mm -hmm. the you know smothering difficult nature of of living with a big family like that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that and highlighting that story. Um, and then the other poem, let's see, the other poem is about an NPR story. Three cats, mm -hmm. for, to, to, to turn the mood a little bit, three cats have outmaneuvered their two humans to hold a blender hostage for weeks. <laughs> uh, what is this? <laughs> so uh, this couple got a Vitamix blender during the Black Friday sale. And apparently they carried it inside the house, put it down and walked out to get a blade to open the box and by the time they came back the cats sort of conquered it and took it as their own and uh, I think one of them sort of posted it on Facebook I think the cats have a Facebook page so she sort of posted the picture on Facebook saying hey look now this one of the cats this cat has now marked his territory let's see how things go do you want me to you know continue on with this story and of course in these times of COVID people are always up for a laugh and I think the day she posted it, she got like 10,000 likes or something. So she kept on going with the story. She's like, I mean, yes, we know it's not difficult. Like we can just lift the cat <laughs> off the box and take it. But then uh -huh. it brings so much joy to everybody. And if we lift one off the box, there are two others who are waiting in line to just take the usurped ruler's place for want of a better word. So <laughs> they basically still, as of date, haven't opened the box yet and haven't been able to use the blender. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That is. It's nice having a you know, a, a, a funny uh, story. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, yeah. So this is a three cats outmaneuver their two humans. And that's from NPR, if anybody would like to find it. And uh, your poem is Appleon, uh, oh, Appliance Gate. Appliance Gate. <laughs> it Appliance took me a gate. second. Appliance Gate. Yeah, so go ahead with that one whenever you're ready. Appliance Gate. 
A Christmas gift came in early for me, a new blender to make some yummy smoothies. So I hefted the box inside and let it be for one tiny minute as I turned off the movie. I turned around and there he was, perched on the box. Max, my tuxedo cat, who has abandoned his play with my woolen socks. He was soon joined by Lando Calrissian and George, the destroyer of worlds, who scouted round the box, tails held high and unfurled. One by one, each sat on the throne and hissed at anyone who dared get too close, for this was their territory, their zone. Oh, and if you touched the box, you saw some bad claws. It's now been a month and more since the gift was delivered. I think it's time I stopped being so lily livered and even this ridiculously skewed score. Cats, 34, me, zero. <laughs> oh, what a fun story. Thanks so much for sharing both of those, uh, Nivedita. Thank you, Tim. It's lovely talking to you, Jen. It was a great episode with Marcella today. It was lovely listening to her for the second time. Yeah, it always is. I, you know, and she's I think one of even those... the third time won't be too less if you ask me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, well thanks, Nivy. Talk to you later. Thank you, Tim. Have a great Sunday. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. So Nivedi to Karthik with uh, two poems. And now let's go to... Um, I'm going to try this first time caller number. This was uh, a nine... So you have a 912 and a 910. We'll see if that's... I'm not sure who this could be, but let's see. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle, and you are live on the air. Who am I talking to? This is Joan Leota. How are you? Ah, great. It's great to hear from you, Joan. So um, so I think you called, did you call and use Skype? Yes, I did, And because uh, I wasn't sure that I was actually working, because I hadn't used my <laughs> Skype in several years. Okay, well, so. I see, do you want to switch to video, and I can call you on Skype, or do you want to just leave it on oh, the phone? Oh, no, no. I'd rather <laughs> leave it on the phone. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds good. But it's great to hear you. I mean, I've seen you um, online all the time, so it's really cool <laughs> to have you um, talking to you for the first time. Where are you calling from? Well, actually, I'm at my daughter's house in Virginia, but I live in North Carolina now. Ah, so. well, great. And and what did you have that you would like to share? Okay, I'm trying to call it up again. Okay. Uh, it's uh, two short poems. I, I really thought that it hadn't gone through, so. <laughs> well, I have them here. I, I have Cloud Day Errand, and I have I've Never. Yes, those are the two. I'm just trying to find the one I sent you. Hmm, I have to go into Scent. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Uh, well, I'm not with my normal uh, things. And that would be, is it Tim at Rattle still? Uh, it would be open mic it? at rattle.com. You'd send it to Okay, me. open mic. Thank you. Yeah. I'm trying to find it in my scent pile. Here we go. Ha ha. All righty. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, wrong one. Done. There it is. There it is. Okay. All right, even a Luddite or Luddite, as they say, can find things eventually. They make it easy. So is there anything you you... want to to say to introduce it before you read uh, the first one? Um, I would just say that this is the first time I'm I'm doing this online, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. And um, I did send both. Do you want me to read both or Yeah, they're both short. Let's do both for sure. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. I thought it was a lot of fun, actually. So Uh, that's about it. Okay, go ahead whenever you're ready. I have it up for everybody who's watching. Oh, okay. All righty. These are the two. Thank you very much, Tim, for letting me have this opportunity. Uh, The first one is the Echo Poem, Cloudy Day Errand. Clouds rain this morning. Morning seems to fit the day. A lack of sparkle on the dew. Do you think fog shroud allows at least the scent of flowers through? You know, I'll need fragrant ones. One for each grave I visit. Yeah, that was kind excellent. Cloudy one. Day Errand. Yeah, Joan Liotta, Cloudy Day Errand. And then the other one, um, what's the other one about? Well, the other one is the I've Never. That um, kind of uh, struck a little chord with me, and I, I sort of did a ditty rather than an actual poem. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if I'd call it a poem. But anyway, here it is. I've Never. I've never been to Ithaca, though I have a friend there to see. I've never been to Lecce though it's recommended to me. I've never been to your house, and I wonder what's within. You see, I'm simply curious about wherever I've not been. 
Oh, that was really fun. It was. I've never. Mm-hmm. Thanks again, Joan, for being a guest and, and joining, uh, joining in on the fun. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for ha- having me and allowing me to read. Yeah, I hope, hope you can again soon sometime. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Yep, bye. And have a great day. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah you too. Bye. Yeah, it was Joan Liotta with two short poems, A Cl- Cloud Day Errand and I've Never. And let's see. Next up, we will call... Let's see. Let's do Jerry Stephenson. We usually have him more toward the end. Do him a little more toward the beginning. At least I try to keep track in my head, but it's tough. Jerry, how you doing today? I'm doing great, Tim. Yourself? I'm doing excellent. It's a good morning for poetry. Um, Isn't so, it? It's just it's been wonderful. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I I've really been enjoying this immensely. Yeah, yeah, Marcella is one of those people. I don't know. She, like, she should be like a household poetry name. I think she's so good. <laughs> I'd be on demand. Uh, you know, turn turn on, uh, please, a couple of poems this morning. Start my day while I make my coffee. Lovely, lovely. She's great. So uh, you have uh, the echo echo poem poem. <laughs> I do do. <laughs> I I like your prompts, say, and and this week I've I've been keeping about three or four plates in the air. I don't know why I'm writing all these different projects, and it's getting a little screwball. So, anyways, I went to do this. I got all confused. I just got into it a bit, and it kind of worked. And I thought, yeah, first right, I'm sending it in because I'm. I really enjoy this form too. This is a opens a whole new world for me. All these things. Yeah, I never heard so of it. And I was all... looking. Uh, I was trying to find like a you know a, a published and in. in you know, famous poem or something that was in this form. I couldn't find anything. <laughs> I went, oh, I killed, I don't know, I, I served for about 45 minutes an hour. And, and I thought, you know what, I'm just, I'm going to see what comes to mind. Sometimes these little glimmers pop up and they work. So this one, I hope it works. I was, I was kind of pleased with it. I've read it again this morning and I thought, well, we're I'm a little shaky around here, but not bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, go ahead. Okay. It's called Echo, Echo, Poem, Poem, Omicron, Gone Wrong. My wandering mind does reflect neglect. To pay attention, consequent, respect, detect. The hint of greater display afford, unreported. Bound to come out delayed, made. Wrapped in devices of betray, astray. Why this untimely foray? Wordplay. When the hard fact is demanded, stand. To, con- sorry, to contend with the trouble bubble. Required to fa- satisfy Dr. Fauci's posse. A very smart man. Man. <laughs> I love that ending. A very smart man, man. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Jerry. <laughs> hey, Tim. Thank you so much. Great show again. Yeah, always a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye. It was Jerry Stephenson with Echo Echo Poem Poem. And um, let's call up Carolyn Codd. Let me try again. Nope, it's ringing this time. Okay. Hello. Hey, Carolyn, you are live on the air with Rattle. How are you doing today? Okay. How are you? I'm doing great. And so what did you want to share? Um, Well, this is a poem. I called it a kind of a prompt poem because it's not from um I, i'm turning off the okay, okay. <laughs> it's um it the the prompts came from my church not from rattlecast ah. and it's um it's uh last year they passed passed out the offering plates but instead of putting in an offering we took out a piece of paper with a word on it interesting and then we were said we could do the whatever we wanted to with the word or ignore it or whatever so um I decided to write about it, and um, the word, my word was overcome, hmm. and um, so I worked on it off and on during the year, trying to see what the, how the year was going to be, and um, then I, I happened to finish it on January 6th, this last couple of weeks ago of all days, uh-huh. and, um, and then I realized that Martin Luther King Day was coming up, and this has to do with him also. Yeah, so for sure. It's a, it yeah, too, perfectly too, timely too. poem. Yeah. Okay, so it's called Question. Overcome, my word gift for 2021. Martin said it, we sing it, we shall overcome. But shall we, or will we be overcome? We're surrounded by fear, 
anxiety, grief, lies, disease, division, divisiveness, anger, hatred, racial injustice. We are feeling depressed, nervous, oppressed, and at times even defeated. So can we overcome? It's a challenge we should overcome, a command we must overcome. We're determined we will overcome, a possibility we can overcome, a promise we shall overcome. But who are we? I myself will overcome. I will overcome myself. You will overcome. You and I will overcome. We shall overcome. We ourselves, together with God's help, will overcome. We need, we ask for God's help. Listening to his directions, we find a way. Seek and speak, seek and speak truth, not lies. Shine, reflect God's light wherever we go. Truth and light overcome darkness. Along with truth and light, give love. Love casts out fear, transcends hate. Jesus said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Love one another. Paul said it. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Martin said it. We still sing it. We shall overcome. Now, shall we? Will we? Oh, excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. That was a wonderful poem and perfectly timely, too. Um, did, yeah. you get to sh- did you get to read it at your church? Um, not yet. I didn't go to church today. I think maybe they're going to put it, we have a monthly um, kind of newsletter oh, thing. I think they're mm-hmm. going to probably put it in that. Oh, that's great. Well, th- I'm so glad you wrote that yeah. and share it today. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Have a good day. Okay. You too. Bye. That was Carolyn Codd with questions, um, a kind of prompt and uh, news poem all rolled into one. And uh, let's see, next we shall do Let's call up uh, Dick Westheimer next. Hey, Dick, how are you doing today? Good morning. Oh, I, I just love that interview with uh, with Marcella. That was wonderful. Well, it wasn't much of an interview. I just had to say, okay, let's let's move on to the next poet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, there was an NPR host named Bob Edwards who mm-hmm. I heard once say, uh, somebody said to him, you know, you interviewed me, you never asked me a question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. no, you just give somebody rope. and Yeah, it's know. nice when it's easy like that, for sure. Um, so, so I, would, what did... I would have loved to have heard more Hebrew from her. Mm-hmm. That, 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 well, that only music. the one book has the Hebrew with it was the issue. So I don't think she had it, you know, set aside with her, which was the problem. Um but but yeah, it's beautiful to hear it in the native too. At the end too, with a check, um, yeah, that that check fairy tale was so cool. Um, yeah, I have a I have a, a Spanish language friend who writes and translates his own poetry, and mm-hmm. sometimes you close your eyes and listen to the Spanish, and it's it's a more it's a, it's just beautiful. Yeah, if, even yeah. though I I have no Spanish. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did not, I, I had a poet's respond poem, but I'm not going to read it cause I stuck it in my chat book. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people did that, I think probably. And, yeah. um, and the thing is if I read it, you know, I, I don't read who wrote it unless I publish the poem. So if I don't publish it, it's safe. But if we end up publishing it, then, uh, I can't not know who, <laughs> who wrote it. So then right. I, I had two versions ready to yeah. fire off to well, you. There you go. <laughs> so, so what did you want to read then? Um, so I have a prompt poem, and if and if you like, I I have a translation poem, uh, oh. this Sombras- Sombraski, Sombraska poem that I just love um, reading a collection of hers. I could read both, or I could just read my prompt yeah, yeah, poem. do both. Go ahead. Okay. Why don't I start with the prompt poem? Okay. Uh, playing like it hurts, um, and I just tried my best. It, you know, this was such a challenging form. So it is. Yeah, it was a. It, it was rough, I, and I'm I'm not done. I'm halfway done with a poem, which I'm I'm happy with it, it, when I get to the end. But it, it's harder than it seem. It's harder than regular rhyme somehow. Just cramming that in there. Yeah, and making it not sound like it's exactly. It's, yeah. So this is playing like it hurts. My bluegrass buddy could never accord a chord that a good old boy or girl wouldn't have heard stirred by stories at his granny's knee. He needed that echo of the front porch, 
the simplicity that no city slicker like me could understand. He'd never wager a major seventh would ever be found anywhere in a song of longing, of missing those green hills, of coal mines, pines, rolling up from the hollers, of the heartache of leaving home, roaming so far from his mama and papa's place to no place that would feel right, except when he sat in a ring picking the old tunes, just right, with folks who knew the rules, schooled in G runs, blue notes, and Bill Monroe's mando chops first hand and could sing the old home place as if they missed it too. Missed it so much it hurt like spite, like the burn of white lightning, like a toothache that wakes you every night, every day, for always. Oh, that was really that was great, Richard. And uh, and I love I have to say I love this form like when it's pulled off you, when you, it's hard to do but when when the poems you know come out they come out really well I love that echo sound yeah and and you know, you, you know I played fans uh, loose and uh, loose with the rules in yeah. order to sort of like get it going although that accord accord <laughs> that felt great. Yeah, well, I think the only way to do it is to be a little loose with it. I think, you know, that's part of the tension of, of expecting it, but then it being a little bit different that makes yeah. it really work. Yeah, I loved it. Um, I, loved, I loved trying to work on it, making it making it happen. Of course, like all poems, I didn't love it at first. It <laughs> yeah. Really yeah, yeah. So if, if you don't mind, if there's time, I'll read the Zimborska poem just because it, I was struck by the notion we were going to do translation. And I don't know if you've ever seen... Um, this book. I love her picture on the cover. Oh, I do. So That's the, great. Yeah. The anti Grant Quackenbush cover. It <laughs> kind of is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the, you know, her with her eyes closed, and uh, and she's just wonderful. Um, so, so who's the translator of this? We should say. Uh, the translator. Uh, they're Claire Kavanaugh and mm. Stanislaw uh, Baranz- ah. Baranska. Oh, cool. um, and I like this translation better than the ones I found online. So that's why you get mine with all the markups Perfect. on it that I sent. Um, it's called Here. I can't speak for elsewhere, but here on Earth, we've got a fair supply of everything. Here, we manufacture chairs and sorrows, scissors, tenderness, transistors, violins, teacups, dams, and quips. There may be more of everything elsewhere, but for reasons left unspecified, they lack paintings, picture tubes, pierogies, handkerchiefs for tears. Here we have countless places with vicinities. You may take a liking to some, give them pet names, protect them from harm. There may be comparable places elsewhere, but no one thinks they're beautiful. Like nowhere else, or almost nowhere, you're given your own torso here, equipped with the accessories required for adding your own children to the rest, not to mention arms, legs, an astounding head. Ignorance works overtime here. Something is always being counted, compared, measured from the roots, and conclusions are then drawn. I know. I know what you're thinking. Nothing here can last, since from and to time immemorial, the elements hold sway. But see, even the elements grow weary and sometimes take extended breaks before starting up again. And I know what you're thinking next. Wars, wars, wars. But there are pauses in between them, too. Attention. People are evil. At ease, people are good. At attention, wastelands are created. At ease, houses are constructed in the sweat of brows and quickly inhabited. Life on Earth is quite a bargain. Dreams, for one, don't charge for admission. Illusions are costly only when lost. The body has its own installment plan. And as an extra added feature, you spin on the planet's carousel for free. And with it, you hitch a ride on the intergalactic intergalactic blizzard with time's 
so dizzying that nothing here on earth can tremble. Just take a closer look. The table stands exactly where it stood. The piece of paper still lies where it was spread. Uh, through the open window comes a breath of air. The walls reveal no terrifying cracks through which nowhere might extinguish you. Yeah, that was excellent. I'm not, I wasn't familiar with that poem. Zimborska yeah, is I just here. love that, that yeah. last line, terrifying cracks through which nowhere might extinguish you. She, she just, she's just, every line to me is thrilling. Yeah, I love that life on earth is quite a bargain, that whole stanza. You know, it's one of those few, I don't know, positive moving poems in that section. It's really great stuff. And who who is the publisher of that? So we can so share that. Um, this is um, Mariner. Mariner, yeah, go so check that out. That is a uh, it's, it's a it's a it's a wonderful it's it's, and of course the Polish is on the side, mm -hmm. and it's Greek. You know, yeah. It, yeah. It, there's no way to even capture. It mm -hmm. just looks like a completely foreign script. Yeah, well, thanks so much for sharing that, uh, Dick. Yeah. It's great, great your poem too, and then uh, and great talking to you. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Dick Westheimer with um, uh, sharing a translation and also uh, his own poem, which was, um, well, I lost the title, but it's somewhere. Great poem, though. And let's call up next. We have this uh, 912 number that I'm not sure who that could be. Let's check it out. Might be Lois uh, Villamere. We'll see. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle. You are live on the air. Who am I talking to? Yes. Can you hear me? Do you have it on? Do you have Hello? the? Uh, do you have the radio on in the background? Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. Well, I don't know what's going on there. Let me. Uh, let me just try again. Maybe there was something wrong with the connection. I heard. I heard him. The person you are trying to reach has a voice. Hmm. So I don't know. Whoever that was, maybe send me a text or something and, and let me know who or what was going on there if you want to call, uh, if you want to join still. Because um, I don't know what was happening and then I couldn't call you back either. Let's call up Patricia Casey now. Hey, Patricia, you are live on the air. How are you doing today? Oh, I I wasn't sure you were with me, and then I heard the thing, the call ringing, so. Yeah, well, here you go. If you want to join by video, just type the uh, video, oh, right. you know, the camera button, yeah. Uh, let's see. Got to get to the right place here. Am I there? there yeah, hello. It's great okay. to see you again. Thanks for joining once again. Thanks, Tim. Um, Good so to see did, you. Yeah, so what do you want to share today? Okay, so I have Innocent Waters. It was published in Muddy River Poetry Review in their fall issue. Ah, great. Yeah, I have it right here. And then MuddyRiverPoetryReview.com is the website. But it's, this is on, in print, so it's not. there's no link to your poem? Or is there? Uh, I did put it in the email. It's, it's actually not in print. Gotcha. It's online. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have the poem here, so so that's fine too. Okay. It's just nice to show the actual website. I was hoping to find it, but that's okay. Oh. Um, okay. So, innocent waters. Is there anything you want to say to introduce it? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, just jump right in then. Go ahead. Okay. Once I wrote of a pebble that rippled and ravished across the water to reach serenity beyond its destructive path in convoluted wrath, where words extrapolated beauty upon my soul. Another stone plunged and sank as it drank its incestuous nepotism, drowning the words that might have, by chance, made the water dance and let me forget. Once upon a time I wrote of shadows from towers of flowers, disrupted, corrupted, but with exquisite imagery painted by eloquent words. Alas, the colorless petals dropped, molested with the crime of no rhyme and other unspeakables, when a pebble rippled across innocent waters. Oh, that's a very interesting poem. I love the internal rhymes throughout that. That was innocent waters. 
um, from from a Muddy River Poetry Review. Um, did you send a second a second poem too? I thought I saw two. Yeah, I, I was hesitating whether I wanted to read it or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, do, do you want to or not? No. <laughs> okay. No, well, well, I'll just enjoy it myself. Then. No, but, I was just how there's so much, so much better echo poems, and it just doesn't fit with the atmosphere of today. So I'd rather not. <laughs> okay. Well, no problem. But it's great having you on. Great seeing you, Patricia. It's always a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Yep. Take care. That's Patricia, Patricia Tracy with um, Innocent Waters. Again, that was from uh, Muddy River Poetry Review. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. And let's call up. Uh, Oh, Bev uh, Wendell Atherstone. Hey, Bev, how are you doing Hi today? There. Great, how are you today? I'm doing great. So what would you like to share? Well, I think I got the wrong idea of the echo poem. I thought you said A, 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 A. Oh, well, that's okay, too. You know, however the poem came out. I think I hear myself in the background, though, so mute that, yeah. Yeah, so um, I wanted to read one from when I was 13 years old, and I wrote in uh, in my grade 8 class, and my teacher hated it. <laughs> but I was so happy when you said last week, A-A-A-A, and I thought I would read it. Yeah, well, that's great. So the, you wrote this it's one. It's very was, short. Yeah, 13 years old. Um, was it the one of the first poems yeah. you wrote? Yes. I mean, yeah. we always wrote poems to our grandparents for Valentine's Day and uh, Christmas and stuff, but, you know, those were sort of like um, little, rhymes. little tiny rhymes. Uh -huh. Anyway, so yeah. this was when I was in my sci-fi era. Oh, cool. Let's see. So uh, let me put this up for everybody. <laughs> Add a little levity. Okay, this is The Monster of Mars from 1958. The Monster of Mars came home one day to a house that was happy, cheerful, and gay. Then away he turned and gasped in dismay. For there in his house, not an arm's length away, stood a man from earth, all moldy and gray. The man started to speak in a stammering way, then turned a deep green and faded away. And there on the ground of Mars he lay, all withered and green until this day. Oh, that was excellent. Uh, my 13-year-old Bev. Thanks for sharing that, Bev. <laughs> um, I don't know how much time we have. I have um, another one I did. Uh, yeah, sure. Just, let, me, let me pull you, this one up. Yeah, yeah, we have time. So uh, what was the other one? Sailor's, Sailor's Delight. Okay, I got it here. And I did, this, I did the same format, A-A-A-A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like a good rhyme. Sailor's so, Delight. Yeah, let me... Uh, <laughs> hang on one second. And, let and me, we've had gorgeous... <laughs> We've had really gorgeous skies in the past while, either in the morning, brilliant red skies, or in the evening. And so uh, when you gave me this opportunity, I thought I'd read, write about that. Perfect. Well, go ahead. Whenever you're ready. Sailor's Delight. Sailor's Delight. A burning sky, my husband said, as morning brightened scarlet red. With fearsome hues, all sailors dread, foretelling roughened seas ahead. Evening skies preferred instead with glimmerings of cherry red made omens of sweet sailing spread from decks to every tall masthead. Their ancient galley chef, old Fred, baked daily sailors' favorite bread. On Sunday morns displayed his spread with hearty meals the crew is fed. The ship is run on a tight thread the captain knows when to softly tread. He's strict, but always fair, it's said. He rules not with his hand, but with his head. His sailors all agree that they've been bred to yearn to sail the unknown seas ahead. Oh, that was great, too. Thanks so much for sharing that. Sailor's Delight. I, I love that form, too, the AAA -A -A rhyme all the way through. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, my teacher at that time told me, yeah, that's not a, that's not a poem. That's not a poem. <laughs> what? I don't know. Do you have... <laughs> <laughs> do you have a poem? Do you have time for me to sit, um, do my poem that was published on Spillwords? 
Uh, sure, why not? Let's go ahead. This is a lament for Fraser Valley dairy cows. It's spill words. Yeah, go yes, ahead. Yes, that was when the cows were dying in the floods. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. That was that was a tragedy up in, in British Columbia. <coughs> yes, in British Columbia. <coughs> Sorry, I was choking a little bit. <clears throat> oh, I'm glad you're okay. Yes, and I'm right next. <laughs> I'm right next door in Alberta. Ah, okay. Lament for the Fraser Valley dairy cows, and expectantly with others huge and gorged, aching, waiting for stanchions' gates that will never open for them again. No disinfectant odor smarts their eyes, nor mechanical pump signals relief at the end of day. Only silence greets their agony. Blinded by their pain, they bawl into a restless sleep until dawn filters golden through the rafters. Their ears strain for the early, for the daily early welcome sounds of scattered hay signaling an end to hunger, of clanking vacuum pumps to relieve their bloated udders. Still, this yearning is only met by silence. Dark pools ooze around their hoofs as puddles converge from large to deep. A shared fear snakes around the barn. They're keening now at frantic pitch. While gritty wet creeps up their legs, it grabs and fetters fast their feet. They shiver as they bellow, quieted as this mud pack cools and boys their swollen teats, providing brief respite. Before it crawls higher, placing a leaden cloak upon their shoulders, holding them as they struggle, desperate to escape, but where? It reaches their tongues and lips, but does not quench their thirst. They raise their heads to jerk free, but they can move no higher. As it creeps up their necks, they choke and gag. Their eyes bulge bulge out in terror. They bawl, They cry, they call. There is no answer, no escaping now. The slimy mire fills their mouths, their nostrils, throats. They slump, muted all. Motors skid along the flood-drenched paths. Allowed to return home at last, farmers turn off their engines and strain to hear their silent herds. Oh, excellent. Very, very sad story there, too. Lament for Fraser Valley Dairy Cows um, by Bev Wendell Atherstone from SpillWords.com. Thanks so much for sharing that, Bev. Thank you so much. Yep. Have a good night. Have a good day. Yeah, bye. Bye. Have a good night. What am I doing? I still think it's nighttime when we're doing this show. Um, let's see. Who? Uh, let's try this 912 number again. He, whoever it was tried calling back. Well, I don't know what's going on there. That didn't work either. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on. So, um, so whoever's at the nine one two, I just can't connect with you. Uh, let's see. Do we have anybody else who wanted to join in by phone or anything? This is back on the ninth. Yeah, we talked to the nine one zero. Who was the nine one zero? I have to put that down in the phone book. Okay. So let me look at see who we have for other poems to share. Oh, Lisa says she's here on Skype. Maybe we'll try uh, Lisa Allison. See if we can get that. She just called. Hmm. Is my Skype not working? That's strange. 
I'll try to close this and open it again. Hey, I think my Skype froze. So it won't let me call me. So let me try closing it, then opening. I heard Mercury Mercury's in retrograde, so maybe that's what's going on. Okay, let's try calling up. Let's see if it'll let me call Lisa this time. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, something was wrong. Okay. Hey, Lisa, how are you doing today? Hey, Tim, good. How are you? I'm great. It's great to see you again. So what do you have that you would like to share with us? So I've got um, a few poems that were published in Unoya Review this week. Oh, very cool. And that is uh, at um, ianoyareview.com, which is E-U-N-O-I-A, review. Yes. Dot wordpress.com. Okay. Yeah. And it's so the shortest word with all five vowels. Uh, I was going to ask if uh, if you knew, is that the significance of it? Why they chose that word for the name of the... I think so. I uh -huh. think so. Very cool. So what, what poem do you want to read? I'll read Still, Still High When We Find Out My Father Has Died. Okay. And is there and, anything you want to say to uh, introduce it? Sure. It's a poem about, you know, the rhythm of life goes on even as we face slow death in our relatives, in loved ones. I've lost a father and a sister to slow diseases. And yet we still need to sort of keep up with what we're doing. So I've always been fascinated by that awkwardness of slow death. Yeah, that would make sense. Still high when we find out my father has died. We dance down the limbs of Parisian streets into the fountain night, shimmy ourselves across cobblestone gray, giggling husband and wife. Pigeons peck in. Oh, where did you go? Oh, I'm, you're still here, so. Pid pigeons peck in to gnaw on our feet, eating our toes like crumbs. Red umbrellas on empty patios sway in a sweatless thrum. Stray cats scatter when my jelly phone rings, pulling us out of our frame. The street lamp burns yellow in my head long after you stop laughing my name. Mm, very moving poem again there. That was uh, still high when we found my, out my father died. Um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Lisa. My pleasure. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, have a good rest of your day. You too. Okay, bye. It was Lisa Allison. And um, let's see. So who else have we? Ah, so look at this. This is um, uh, Jerry Stephenson. If you remember last week, Jerry Stephenson uh, was talking, had a poem about the Tuart House, he calls it. And he sent us a picture, which we'd asked for. It's not a, it's not a house that we, uh, it would be in the Wikipedia or anything. But here is the uh, Tuart House by where, uh, by where Jerry lives. That, that is the house that he was writing about last week. So thanks for sharing that, Jerry. It's nice to see. And it's buried in snow. Look at all that snow. Up in the is Alberta, is that where Jerry lives, or the Pacific, nor, or the British Columbia? I can't remember exactly, but uh, but yeah, yeah, great photo, great, great house, a lot of snow, very atmospheric. That would be a good setting for a haunted house. Thanks for sharing that, Jerry. Um, Ted Guevara has an echo verse poem for us, and this is Glint. Um, let's see. So this week's poem is Glint. It slightly alludes to Austrian symbolist painter Gustav Klimt and his use of gold foil, notably in The Kiss. He never married, but was said to have 14 children from his many women. I think fornication is only from those who reflect on the artist's life. Um, Austria was a most religious country, and here was Gustav churning out provocative masterpieces all the time. He includes a photograph. This is, of course, The Kiss, which is one of the most famous paintings ever painted. Um, that's not the regular version of it, is it? I think it's a little different. Maybe it's my imagination. Anyway, and then here is, uh, here is Ted's poem, Glint. Stones crumble or smoothen underwater. We cater. Lust unveils no color but a shining squalor of its own. Rips mighty outside the heart, vies depart. We climped gold our intent, try our hand it withstand at steering truth with ions reversed we curse to deem us wolves with lame mandibles 
how intangible. We go to bed hungry, craving, tame, awake in this mistake. And that is uh, Ted Guevara's poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Ted. Uh, really cool. I, I really like the echo verse form. I'm surprised that there aren't many, you know, more poems written in this format. Um, Lois Vidamir um, sent us a poem. And uh, I assume she wants me to read it. So um, she didn't reply to say not, even though she doesn't seem to be here, unless that was the 912 number I can't call. So I'm going to read uh, Lois's poem. Let me put it in a Word document so we don't... Okay. Here's Lois's poem. Hot Tea in the Afternoon, an Echo Verse Poem by Lois Perch Viamir. She lit a candle to inhale pale scents of caramel and vanilla burn, yearn for a flickering flame as the sun faded, shaded in the late afternoon. Moon rising, she brewed a cup of hot tea quietly, not her regular routine, unseen images hazy in the late fall, recall when she shivered without warning, morning hot tea brought thoughts of her mother, another memory stacked high on the table, unable to choose from an assortment of flavors, savors her tea bag still stored in a round bin. Very, I love this echo verse format, and that was a great use of it, Lois, thanks so much for sharing that. I'm really surprised that more people don't write in the echo verse form. I think maybe we're going to have to start. It's a really nice format. Um, and here's Carlton Johnson's poem. Um, this is... He's sending a poem from his collection, A Thimble of Time, which you can find on Amazon.com. And this poem was inspired by Wallace Stevens' 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. So let me... Uh, let's do this here. This is... Uh, Actually, let me do this. Okay, here we go. This is a Carlton Johnson poem that he's sharing today from his book. So you can find that book at Amazon.com. Just look up Carlton Johnson. Oops, not, that's not right. That's not right. There it is. A baker's dozen of looking at small things. Homage to Wallace Stevens. <clears throat> One. A moat of dust hangs suspended on a blade of sun, streaming through a pane of milk-white summer afternoon. Two, a fine thread, still small, yet still red and so strong, to hold hearts fibrously together. Three, a fine dust of flour hovers in a glass bowl, preparing the heat of transformation. Four, a single thought percolating, in the subconscious, growing to web its illumination, our mind. Five, the atom, smallest of all, but not quite all, but depth of wonder, hold no harbor. The winter comes in, downy flakes that float like satin sheen without mistake, picture perfect in a six-sided composition. Seven, if I had one, I might have used it. However, there are no more penny candies anymore, so alas, no more scents. Eight, this speck of black along the counter. What the heck is this flutter of an object before my eye? I lash out, but not in anger. The kernel or the core of the apple is the seed of imagination. See it grow. Ten, the single blade more stalwart than most. It is solitary, yet unified. The emerald sword stabs the blue skyline. Eleven, the smallest dot of one point times New Roman makes a stand at stopping a large run-on sentence. Screech, thud. Twelve, a line drawn mathematically has no height, no width, only the depth of human understanding as it stretches beyond measure, racing towards infinity. Thirteen, the breath I breathe is small but large, small in scope but large in hope, for another day, another breath. Excellent poems. That was uh, Carlton Johnson with uh, A Baker's Dozen of Looking at Small Things. Homage to Wallace Stevens. And as Carlton mentioned, that is his, from his book A Thimble of Time, which you can find on Amazon.com. Just look up Carlton Johnson, A Thimble of Time. So thanks for sharing that, Carlton. Um, let's see. Here's a little one by Kimberly McNeil. We'll read that. And then I have... Uh, the Saiku, and, and maybe I'll read something else too. Let me, but let me hear. Here is a, 
what was this called again? This was Death Prequel 2 by Kimberly McNeil. And she sent this in this week. Here we go. Like most male gender robots, he felt screwed. Hospice hidden, the trunk man knew the abysmal facts of his bedbound life. His transparent skin now a suicidal blue. The violent force fed choking dread. Without arms to slap and legs to kick, the trunk used his voice to scream and beg. Somebody touch me, please, he said. Treat this bone deep pressure sores. Treat his bone deep pressure sores. Sorry. Escape his soiled coffin bed. A brainwashed, ignored, and forgotten head. He was dying to be dead. Very cool. I love the rhymes there again. Thanks for sharing that. That was Kimberly McNeil. Um, let me check to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Because I'm in no rush. It's one of those days where I'm not in any rush at all. Um, I don't know about you. I don't even know who, who's still watching. I assume everybody's still watching, though. Um, I can't look at Facebook still. Um, and over on YouTube, oh, we still have 17 of you here. Good to see you. Okay. So I wanted to share one. I just thought maybe I'd share this. So the James Dickey review came out. Let me see if I can put this on the screen. Oops. So this is a James Dickey review. And there's some talk, um, just regularly, it happens a lot, about whether or not sharing poems on the Rattlecast counts as publication. Um, and, the, and the answer to the question is, I don't really know. It just depends on the um, on the publisher. We um, At Rattle, we've published you know, a few times poets, I think maybe three or four times already, poets have um, read a poem, like a guest will have read a poem on the air. Um, and it's they say it's new and I think it's great and we've we've published it we also published a poem from the critique of the week uh, later in rattle so they come out like six months or a year later and um, I don't think there's any problem with it in my opinion um, it's a different medium so if according to at least in the United States according to the Copyright Act of 1976 um, everything is automatically a copyrighted intellectual property and then you slice it up and sell different parts of it and in my opinion, having an audio and video component is uh, is one slice of that pie, and then having a first serial rights or one-time printing rights or something like that is another slice of the pie. And I think it's fine to um, to mix and match, but every publisher might not agree. So I don't know. So there's rumors that if you read a poem that's broadcast and, and archived on YouTube like this, that counts as publication, um, and other publishers wouldn't want to publish it. Um, I've never found that to be the case, though, which is what's interesting. So... Um, so over the years, the last couple of years, some people have asked, like, hey, Tim, do you have any poems to, to we could look at to publish? And um, one of them was uh, um, um, Bill Wal or William Walsh. I can't remember if he went by Bill or William. Yeah, William Walsh is what he goes by. And um, another one was um, a guest in a couple of weeks who had its Rosebud. Uh, Lester Graves Lennon asked for some poems too. And every time people ask for poems, I say, the only thing I write these days are stuff I share on this uh, podcast, so does it matter? And um, everybody's always said, no, just send it to me anyway. I don't care. And uh, so James Dickey Review, William Walsh asked for some poems, maybe uh, last about a year ago at this time. And uh, so James Dickey Review just came out with a p with two poems that I read previously on the Rattlecast. And I thought maybe I'd just share one, just because why not? And this is my Utsi poem. If you remember, um, uh, I think the prompt was to write just a persona poem. And I think there was a news article that week, maybe, about the Utsi Museum reopening. Or somehow I saw something about Utsi that week. And so I thought, hey, let's write a persona poem from Utsi's voice. And Utsi, if you don't know, is the natural mummy of a man who lived between 3400 and 3100 BCE, discovered in 1991 in the Utsul Alps. And uh, so here's this Utsi poem uh, from the prompts on this Rattlecast. And then now it's in the James Dickey Review, so that's fun. Utsi. You've made a museum of me, stack stones like blue ice at the feet of my mountain. We pile our stones on the peaks where the wind speaks in the voices of the gods. Am I one of your gods? Is this why you brought me here? I whisper, but there is no wind. Your torch lights never flicker in this smooth room. Everything echoes. What would you like to know? The secrets of time. What is time but the spine of a mountain bending back? And what is a story but the arc of time? You know mine. You've made a map of my meals. You've measured my wounds with every kind of metal. I worked with metal. I know the rocks that weep and the power of the blade. But I'll tell you what you know. 
I climbed down to the village, and the smoking huts were too much smoke. I killed two painted men with the same arrow, wrestled with a knife, and fled. They found me by my fire, two days later, my belly full of meat and bread. You found me still full of that meat and bread. I'll tell you what you really want to know. Was I happy in my primitive life? Was I happier than you are now? Yes, so happy that I fled. So happy that I built the flame and ate the bread that brought the arrow I knew was coming. So happy with life that the ice was all I had left to turn to. That was my Utsi poem in his voice for that. And if you, if you, I guess I probably should have explained that Utsi, um, the really fascinating thing about him is that they, you know, he was so well preserved that the content in his stomach was still there. And they could trace back in time by looking at his intestines um, how the weak up to his death had gone and apparently he uh he was attacked and fled um he had some some wounds that were like a few days healed and uh and then he fled up the mountains was probably pursued it seems like he thought that he made was in the clear um and so he sat down and made a meal um because there was like burned meat and things that he would had eaten and then right then he was shot in the back with an arrow and that was the end of Utsi. so um Anyway, that was that poem. And let's look at the, uh, yeah, so my only point is this This is a nice uh, magazine, James Dickey Review. I want to do more show and tell stuff. So we get so much stuff in the mail. So I'm going to start sharing some stuff that just comes in the mail too. Um, so here is uh, the Saiku for the week. And the Saiku, really quickly, is based on this article. This is, uh, let me see if I can shrink it so you can see it. Oops, it's the wrong way. Let me see. So this article, kind of, there you go. They make them so big these days. Everything's made for a phone. But the surprising, the surprisingly simple arithmetic of smell. And um, it's sort of always been a mystery how we smell things. Because if you think about it, we're surrounded by scents all the time. And if you smell something, it's never in the same context. And so we smell these different, different atoms that are aerosolized and, uh, or different molecules that are aerosolized. And it's in this whole like, potpourri of things, but still our experience of scent remains the same. Coffee smells like coffee. And um, for a cricket, grass smells like grass. And so what these researchers did is try to figure out how that works. And so they, they um, used operant conditioning and trained crickets to open their mouth, basically, when they smelled um, a grass smell, because they like to eat like fresh grass. And so they, um, so they sort of had this uh, the system where they would give it an artificial odor to train to identify as grass, as like grass was coming. And then they looked at its brain and, saw, and looked at what was going on inside the, the grasshopper as they were uh, smelling things. And what they found is that it's always different. Different neurons fire in different contexts. If it's more humidity, if it's warmer, if there's other scents in included in it, there's this whole constellation of stuff and it never matches. And what they found out is it's more like there's like an on switch and an off switch. And if there's enough yeses without any no's in their things, then that's how it tells the smell. And then once you have the sense of smell, it smells the same regardless of whatever it is. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's a complicated, uh, complicated explanation, but that was the uh, interesting article I read this week. And the Saiku really quickly for this week was this. Even here in the morning dew is coffee. Even here in the morning dew is coffee. And that was your Saiku for this week. And that is your show for this week. Now, next week, the prompt is going to be Make the title of your poem a question and the body of your poem the answer, or the other way around. So it's a call and response format. So ask a question in the title and answer it with the poem. And that is your question. You might want to check out Ace Bodges, who uh, he was the guest on Rattlecast, I don't know, sometime in June or May, maybe. And he has a whole series of poems that are based on questions. He asks people to ask him questions, and then he writes poems in the answer is one of his... Uh, one of the things he does. So I might want to check his stuff out, but do that. Um, have a question and then have your poem be the answer. That is your prompt for this week. And next week's guest is going to be Bill Gloss. 
Um, he has a new book, Postscript to War, which came out from uh, just now from Main Street Rag Press, I believe. Yeah, Main Street Rag Press. And uh, he's also, he wrote one of the best poems, in my opinion, we've ever published, that Phases of Erasure. And it was one of those poems we nominated for a Pushcart Prize, and I can't believe it didn't win. It was so good. He's a, a war veteran, and which is why you can see the title is uh, Postscript to War. And so that's the theme he writes about frequently. Um, but, but he's just a wonderful poet and interesting person. So we will talk to him next week about his book, Postscript to War. And that is going to be the guest for next week. And Rattlecast number 128 at the usual time, Sunday, January 23rd, 9 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great rest of your Sunday in the meantime. Talk to you then. Goodbye.